past. It's the first time the candidates will meet on stage since the end of September. They were supposed to debate virtually last week after President Trump's COVID diagnosis, but the president canceled. Six topics are expected to be covered tonight. They include fighting COVID-19, American families, race in America, climate change, national security, and leadership. Things will look and sound slightly different tonight. Candidate microphones will be muted for certain portions of the debate. It's part of an effort to enforce the debate rules, where both candidates are supposed to have two minutes uninterrupted to respond to a question, followed by an open discussion. You recall, that is not what happened last time around. The American people should speak. You should go out and vote. You're in voting now. Vote and let your senators know how you strongly you feel. Court? Let Vote now. Are you going to pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know you're a senator. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the question you is, the question Supreme is, court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, your, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so list? Right. Gentlemen, is, I think this we've is ended so this. This is so unprecedented. All right, let's bring in Caitlin Huey Burns and Nicole Killian. Caitlin is CBSN's political reporter, and Nicole is a CBS News correspondent. Uh, she covers all things Washington, but there you see her inside the debate hall tonight. So, Nicole, let me begin with you. The president has made it very clear that he is not happy with the choice of moderator and the topics. What might be those very public? Uh, what might be behind, rather, those very public complaints? Well, we know that a lot's at stake with this debate. What the Trump campaign has, has argued is that it believes this debate should focus more on foreign policy. It says that that has been the tradition in the past. But, you know, I had an opportunity to speak with one of the chairs of the debate commission who said that is not necessarily the case and that from the outset they made clear to the Trump campaign and to both campaigns that it would be the moderator who sets the topics. And so that's, of course, uh, what you lay out uh, at the top of the segment. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, you know, also we've seen the president uh, go after the moderator. Uh, we know he wasn't happy with the last debate uh, with Chris Wallace as the moderator. So uh, perhaps it might be an attempt to try to undercut uh, whoever is in that role before the debate happens. But again, you know, the de debate commission stands by its selection of these moderators. Uh, it believes that this has been a fair process. And so, again, uh, just minutes away from seeing how it'll play out tonight. Well, Caitlin, you have been covering voters and the voting process around the country for months now. Give us some of the common themes that you've been hearing. Hi, Elaine. Well, two things stand out to me after spending the past several days on the ground in key battleground states talking to voters. The first is the way in which the act of voting has become a campaign issue in and of itself. We've seen voters be very strategic about how they are going to cast their ballots. We've talked to voters who are tracking lines on apps. They are very intent on making sure their ballot is in, in time to be counted and being very strategic about making sure they have all the information needed to be able to cast a ballot in a pandemic. Because as we know, the pandemic has put voting rights and access front and center, but also how we cast ballots. Several states have been ramping up options to give people instead of going in person. The other interesting dynamic that we've seen on the ground is how coronavirus is playing in, in terms of shaping how people are viewing this race. Lots of supporters of former Vice President Biden that we talked to say that the pandemic is front and center, that it's uprooted their lives, that they see this race as a referendum on the president's handling of the pandemic. When we talk to supporters of the president, they don't see the pandemic as front and center. Most of them say the economy is top of mind heading into this election. They tell us that the president did what he could do on the pandemic and they want things to return back to how they were before. This idea of returning back to normalcy is actually playing on all sides and among lots of different voters that we talk to. Supporters of the president say turning back to normal means getting back to the economy before the pandemic. And supporters of Joe Biden who want to return to normalcy think of it very different. They think of it as a time before Trump took office. 
Well, Nicole, the president's path to victory seems to be fairly narrow, according to CBS's Battleground Tracker. Has the Trump campaign had any sort of recalibration in these closing weeks? Well, I think the campaign's mission has always been to try to defend those states that the president won in 2016 and also try to find paths through other states, uh, for instance, like Nevada or like Minnesota. You know, I can tell you that certainly one state that both the Trump campaign, the Biden campaign are really targeting in these final days is Florida, Florida, Florida. Uh, if I had a whiteboard like Tim Russert used to, I mean, that really <laughs> is a key state. Um, you know, certainly the president needs that one. You know, we've talked about states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, and that support in those states may be slipping for the president. But if he doesn't win Florida, that could spell big trouble for him. So he really does need that state. At the same time, Democrats see an opportunity there. I had a chance to speak with the chair of the Democratic National Committee, Tom Perez, who, who said he, he would like to make up some ground there if they can in these final days. And as you know, we saw former President Barack Obama on the trail for the first time in Philadelphia, another pivotal state uh, that we discussed, but also uh, in Florida. He will be there this weekend uh, as there will be a lot of emphasis on a vote early day. So again, you know, everything is very strategic in these final days. The president, of course, holding some rallies uh, in Florida following the debate. So uh, certainly that is one of the states to watch. Absolutely. Well, Caitlin, as we've been reporting, the U.S. Elections Project says more than 47 million people have already voted across the country, with many states breaking early voting records. How does that change the dynamic of tonight's debate, does it? That's right. These record-breaking numbers, we were just in Georgia, which every day is reporting record-breaking numbers uh, when it comes to the early vote. As you mentioned, 47 million people already having cast their ballot raises the question about how an event like tonight can do anything to change voters' minds if they've already participated. What's been really interesting to see in this race is that even though we've had a global pandemic, that there haven't been many instances over the course of the past several months that we've been in a general election mode that have changed the trajectory of this race. Nationally and in key battleground states, Joe Biden continues to lead. That's why his campaign wants to see tonight as a kind of a do no harm, get through it. The Trump campaign, however, has been falling behind in key battleground state polls, needs to do something to change the future of this race, try to shape it or change it around in the next 12 days. But with people already voting and in record numbers, does a night like tonight do anything to really change the fundamentals that we've seen be reliably consistent this cycle? All right, as we've been speaking, Caitlin, I believe those are live pictures. Is that right, control room? Um, that we saw with us from just moments ago. We are, in fact, looking at live pictures there in Nashville as we wait for this debate to get underway. But there you saw it looked like a, a motorcade. Uh, we can't say exactly uh, if that was the president or not, but um, certainly we're keeping an eye on these pictures as we get closer here to the top of the hour. Nicole, as we wait here, talk to us more about the topics that are going to be discussed tonight and how the announcement of attempted election interference last night could come into play. Well, we know that the topics will cover a variety of ground. There is going to be one segment focused, again, on COVID-19, on American families, on national security, on race in America, on climate change, and on leadership. So each of those segments will run about 15 minutes apiece. And then, you know, as far as this issue of national security, we would certainly expect that this issue of uh, foreign election interference, especially in light of that uh, a very hastily called press conference that we saw yesterday by the FBI and the uh, DNI director uh, that that will come up because we really have not heard from the president or former Vice President Joe Biden uh, to even know their reaction, to know what the president uh, might know about this. So certainly uh, we expect that to be pretty high up, uh, uh, that the moderator would raise that topic with both candidates this evening. All right, uh, Caitlin Huey Burns and Nicole Killian. Great to see you both. Thank you very much. 
CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys Anthony Salvanto has the latest on what the race is looking like ahead of tonight. Anthony? Hey there, Elaine. Let's take a look at the state of the race heading into this, the final debate. First thing to note, if this year we see record turnout, let's suppose it is, as some estimate and we think, it could get to 150 million votes. Well, about a third of that has already been cast with people showing up early to vote at early voting centers and casting their ballots by mail. So the pool of voters left to be persuaded by this debate is getting smaller. Couple that with the fact that well over 90, 95 percent in some places in these polls, people say they've already made up their minds. So what's this about? It could be about motivating turnout for Joe Biden, maybe trying to seal in those voters who are already backing him. You look at these states across the upper Midwest and they're leaning blue towards Joe Biden. He's also got a couple of possibilities in toss ups in places like Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, etc. So for the president, what does he need to do? He needs to start winning those toss ups and then flipping a couple of states. Let's suppose the president once again wins Florida, wins Georgia, wins North Carolina. Well, starts to recreate that 2016 map, but now he's going to have to also probably win Ohio and then flip Pennsylvania back out of Joe Biden's column to start putting him closer. And then maybe a Wisconsin again, just in one scenario to get him back over the top. There's a number of different paths that could play out, and that's what we see. Those are some of the scenarios we see as we head into this final home stretch after the debate tonight. Elaine? All right, Anthony, thank you. With early voting already well underway, tonight is the last chance the candidates will have to go head to head to sway undecided Americans. Last debate featured a range of attacks from both candidates. Some lines went beyond the issues, even touching on their personal lives. Here's one of that night's most heated moments. It's about you. That's what we're talking about. Here. All right, that's the, end of the, here. that's the end of the didn't segment. We're, mo money. we're moving on. There's, he didn't take them. Well, Vice President, very, Chris, ex no. I, can I be honest? It's a very important try question. Try to be honest. No, I, he, I, stood up, no, he stood I, up. No, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. No, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you don't get rid of the Russians, you know what? You're really not you're true. Tape, you're doing it. You're going to have true, gentlemen. I hate to raise my voice, but it seems to be. Why shouldn't I be different than the two of you? For more, let's bring in Lanhee Chen. He was the policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign, as well as an advisor for Marco Rubio's 2016 presidential campaign. Lanhee, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. So before I get to tonight's debate, I want to ask you about Senator Romney and his announcement that he did not vote for President Trump uh, this year. Now, he declined to say whether he voted for Joe Biden, but given your your background with the senator, why do you think that he made that decision public in the way that he did? Well, I think, you know, his opinion of, uh, of President Trump, some of the things President Trump has done is no secret to anybody. Uh, they are dispositionally probably as different as two people you can find in, in public life. Uh, I, I think Senator Romney was probably getting a lot of questions about what he was uh, going to do, what he was planning to do in this election, who he was going to vote for. Uh, and, and I think he's letting it uh, be known that he didn't support President Trump. Obviously, we don't know who he voted for. We're not going to know unless he lets us know that. Uh, but part of this was his effort to, to answer the question. It's a very important election. Uh, some may wonder where he stands. And I think he wanted to, to make that as clear as he could during this time when people are already uh, casting votes and making decisions about this year's election. So let's turn to the debate. The format of this debate, complete uh, with this now mute function, is in response to that first debate where we saw that series of interruptions. Do you think, Lonnie, this debate will be vastly different compared to what we saw earlier? I don't know that it'll be vastly different, Elaine. I think, look, I think both candidates are still going to try and get their points in, regardless of whether they're speaking over their opponent, regardless of whether their time is up. Uh, I do think the mute function, if used properly, can ensure that we have a little bit better back and forth, a little bit more organized back and forth than we saw in that first debate. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, President Trump has got a certain style. And if you look at how he approaches these debates, 
It tends to be a little bit more confrontational. It tends to be a little bit more combative, a lot more combative in some cases. And, and so I wouldn't expect him to deviate too much from that style. I think that's largely how he's going to make his points tonight. Uh, and so, you know, I'm skeptical the mute button is going to have too much of an impact, but hopefully it will make some difference on the margins and the American people can actually hear some reasonable exchanges between these candidates. Right. After all, this is, in fact, an opportunity or is supposed to be an opportunity for voters to hear directly from the candidates themselves. Uh, so let's talk about the president's strategy. You know, the playbook looks in some ways similar to 2016, calling for his opponent to be jailed. There are unsubstantiated claims about voter fraud. This year, of course, we have seen the president attacking doctors and scientists, uh, contradicting his claims. I wonder, Lani, what you make of that. Does that appear to be an effective strategy at this point, given what we have seen from public polling on some of these issues? And do you expect to see more of that tonight? A couple of things are clear. First of all, I think the president is engaging in this strategy because he's comfortable in it. It's kind of where he feels like he goes to uh, when, he, when he needs to... Uh, to, to make headway on one point or another. I would say I think it's effective with respect to his political base. It's very clear that they are mobilized. They are uh, very encouraged and enthusiastic about the president. Not a particularly effective set of techniques if you're trying to speak to undecided voters or voters who might, for example, wonder what will the next four years look like in a Trump presidency. Uh, I've made the argument repeatedly that I think the president would be strongest if he was willing to get out there and talk about his plan for the next four years as opposed to all of these other things. But that hasn't been where the president, it hasn't been where his campaign has been. I think the president believes it is effective at mobilizing his base, but his base is going to be supporting him regardless. The question now is where he gets the additional support necessary to get him across 270 electoral votes. I don't think that the strategy we've seen pursued thus far is frankly going to be very effective if that is the ultimate goal. So I think that the president and the Trump campaign have a fundamental decision to make with less than two weeks left. And that is, are they going to speak to voters who haven't made up their minds, or are they going to speak to those who probably are already going to support the president and try and gin them up even more? Um, in our final uh, minutes, Lanhi, I want to ask you about where you see Joe Biden's biggest vulnerabilities. You know, you have President Trump bringing a guest uh, tonight who is a business partner of Hunter Biden's uh, to the debate. He's been attempting to push, as you know, these debunked allegations of fraudulent activities um, by the Biden um, family. So I wonder, um, Lanhi, as we look at the landscape now, you have... Amy Coney Barrett uh, on the verge of confirmation, it appears, uh, as a Supreme Court justice. What is your uh, take on those areas that the president should be focusing in on? And, and when you look at Joe Biden's vulnerabilities as well, what are those areas that you see as places where the president should focus his efforts? It's a line of attack, Elaine, very similar to what we saw from Mike Pence in his debate against uh, Kamala Harris a few weeks ago. And that is to try and, and tag Joe Biden as a liberal, out of touch progressive whose policies uh, will take America in, in, in a fundamentally bad direction when it comes in particular to the economy. So I think one imperative is to tie his opponent to the far progressive left from a policy perspective. You saw him try to do that, for example, in Pennsylvania the other day, talking about Joe Biden's opposition to fracking. And then in the second order, I would say it's also going to be important for him uh, to, to, to draw contrast in terms of uh, of energy and competency. And, and that's going to be something, you know, it's a hard sell because I think a lot of people know Joe Biden has a lot of experience in government, but it is fundamentally about that competency for 47 years. Joe Biden's been in public life. You've heard this line and he hasn't gotten a whole lot accomplished. It's about contrasting the president's accomplishments over the last few years with those of Vice President Biden during his 47 years in public life. I think trying to paint Joe Biden as a as an element of Washington from Washington, you know, we are still in a political cycle where outsiders are favored to a certain degree. I think those are going to be the strongest places for the president to go. Whether he actually gets there, whether he can be successful, we'll have to see. All right, Lanhi Chen, Lanhi, always great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. 
Coming up, new rules for tonight's debate. Will cutting off the candidate's microphones help or hurt the candidates? Former senior advisor to Hillary Clinton, Philippe Rhinus, will be here to give us his take. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's recording. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Hopefully, he's going to play by the rules. Hopefully, everybody's been tested. Hopefully, it's all worked out this way the rules are. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. That was Joe Biden on his way to Nashville earlier today. As we've mentioned, one of those new rules is cutting the microphone of the candidate not speaking in order to ensure no interruptions. It will go into effect at the beginning of each 15-minute segment. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and Senior Advisor to Hillary Clinton, Philippe Rhinus, joins me now to talk more about what we can expect tonight. Philippe, good to see you again. Thanks so much for being with us. So how do you expect this muted microphone setup to work? Uh, Elaine, I think it's going to be a doozy. I, I think it might backfire uh, for a simple reason. Um, you know, the, the debate is in six 15-minute segments. And the first four minutes are going to have this uh, muting situation where the person not speaking will not be able to be heard. The problem is, if you tell someone that for four minutes that they have to behave, you're telling them that for the other 11 minutes, you can do what you want. And, um, you know, sure, so it's going to keep Donald Trump in check while it's being used. But I'm not sure that the uh, 66 minutes of the 90 are going to go any better, because if he's intent on 
you know, railing against uh, Joe Biden, then he's going to find a way to do it, no matter how many buttons, uh, you know, the moderator and the producers have. Well, the president is bringing a former business partner of Hunter Biden, Tody Bobolinsky. Then-candidate Donald Trump, as you recall, brought accusers of former President Bill Clinton to the 2016 debate against Hillary Clinton. Who do you think, Philippe, this strategy plays to? I, you know, I don't think that Donald Trump has been one Tony Bobolinsky away from turning this race around. So I... I had not heard the name before today. I understand the point. Um, you know, maybe he should have brought an a epidemiologist with him or someone he can point to and say, this is someone that I uh, am now taking advice from and who I think can help with COVID and I'm naming as COVID czar. I really don't think that the 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 million people watching really want to hear about this guy. Uh, and it's just to come out as such a jumble when Donald Trump, whether it's muted or unmuted, when it just has a chance to start spewing all this Hunter Biden stuff, it's not going to be coherent to the listener. And he's been doing this for a year. He was impeached over this. So, you know, he's in the predicament he is with 11 days to go. Uh, it's beyond doubling down. He's, he's quadrupling, been coupling or whatever it is down. And it's 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 not going to work. Um you know, fighting the coronavirus, of course, is one of the topics tonight. And while campaigning in Philadelphia last night, former President Obama slammed the Trump administration's response. Let's listen to just a little bit of that. We literally left this White House a pandemic playbook that would have shown them how to respond before the virus reached our shores. They probably used it to I don't know, prop up a wobbly table somewhere. We don't know where that playbook went. Eight months into this pandemic, cases are rising again across this country. Donald Trump isn't suddenly going to protect all of us. He can't even take the basic steps to protect himself. So, Philippe, as you know, since the last debate, President Trump and many people in his orbit tested positive for the coronavirus. So how might the conversation about COVID-19 be different tonight because of that? I think on the question of health, um, it's really going to be up to the moderator, because other than, you know, a glancing reference or maybe uh, a glancing blow, I'm not sure Joe Biden is going to say you know, well, you're the one that, since we last spoke, has been in the hospital for four days and on a cocktail of experimental medication. Um, I think, you know, if Kristen Welker comes out of the gate the way um, her colleague Savannah Guthrie did last week when she interviewed Donald Trump and pressed him on specifics about, did you have pneumonia? When did the last time you test? That might be a more effective way to do it, but I'm not exactly sure that that's what's on the tip of uh, the moderator's tongue. And I don't I, you know, if if uh, Donald Trump goes after Joe Biden on handling COVID, and if he does what he did last time about saying that the Obama administration and Joe Biden blew handling SARS, I think you might hear Joe Biden either just echo what President Obama said or just, you know, say, as President Obama said yesterday, because there's there's no one that makes Donald Trump see red more than Barack Obama. It's just it's. No one handles him or gets under his skin more. In our final 20 seconds or so, Philippe, how confident or not confident should Democrats be feeling right now? I think they should let themselves feel confident. Look, I was wrong four years ago. A lot of us are wrong. Most of us were wrong. I don't think we should live in fear and uh, paralysis in 2016. It's a different situation. There are no third parties. He's having a harder time defining his, his uh, opponent negatively. And, you know, people are forgetting that we've had two things since. One, we've had 2018, which did not go well for the Republicans. And two, there's something that Donald Trump has now that he didn't have four years ago. And that's a record. And it's abysmal. And, you know, this might be as simple as All right. people want to get rid of him. This is the first time they have a chance to fire All him. Right. That doesn't mean it's the first day they would have. All right, Philippe, sorry to cut you off. We're coming up to the top no. of the hour. Philippe Ryan is always great to have you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Thank you, Elaine. The final debate between President Trump and Joe Biden is about to get started. Let's go to our CBS News primetime special. Vice President Joe Biden. Get out and vote the red wave. 
is coming. President Donald Trump. We choose hope over fear. Unity over division. Science over fiction. Truth over lies. We are going to keep on fighting. We are going to keep on winning, winning, winning. This is the most important election in the history of our country. The final presidential debate. Good evening, I'm Nora O'Donnell in the nation's capital with John Dickerson and Gail King. In just a few minutes, the presidential candidates will face off for the final time. You're looking at live pictures from the debate hall at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. CBS News Battleground Tracker poll showed Joe Biden leading in nearly every one of the swing states that will determine the election now, just 12 days away. And we're seeing records broken already. Nearly 50 million Americans have voted, and that's more ballots cast before Election Day in 2016. A lot of people, this is President Trump's last opportunity to go face to face with a former vice president. As you remember, their second debate was canceled when Mr. Trump balked at a virtual format after he tested positive for COVID-19. Now, each candidate held an individual town hall one week ago. Both were tame affairs compared to that first meeting, which you can describe as an over-the-top slugfest, marred by insults and interruptions that left many wishing the organizers could simply just cut the microphones. So tonight, while one candidate is answering a direct question for two minutes, the other candidate's microphone will be muted. The moderator, NBC's Kristen Welker, has chosen six topics, fighting COVID-19, American families, race in America, climate change, national security, and leadership. Leading up to this debate, Biden prepared while he stayed in Delaware. The president held his debate prep in the spaces between multiple campaign rallies this week. There's so much at stake. We want to bring in Nicole Killian. She is inside the debate hall in Nashville. Good evening, Nicole. Good evening, Nora. The Biden campaign says the former vice president will use tonight as another opportunity to speak directly to the American people and lay out his agenda. They view this debate as a test of presidential temperament and say Biden is prepared for whatever comes his way. They do expect the president will go after Biden and his son Hunter, but they think that's going to backfire. Biden told reporters today he hopes the president plays by the rules. Nora. All right, let's bring in CBS's Paula Reed because she covers the White House and President Trump. Paula? Good evening, Nora. President Trump heads into tonight's debate with little formal preparation. He said this week, though, he insists that he gets plenty of practice by fielding questions from reporters nearly every day. A senior campaign official says the president will try to focus at least some of tonight's discussion on Biden's son, Hunter. But many of his other advisors are encouraging the president to let his opponent speak more than he did last time in the hope that Biden will make some mistakes. Nora. All right, Paula Reed, we are just moments away. And John Dickerson, can anything that happens tonight change the trajectory of this race? Well, it's the last moment of the race that is guaranteed to have a huge viewership. If it can, tonight's the night. All right, let's listen now to Good the moderator. Good evening from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Kristen Welker of NBC News, and I welcome you to the final 2020 presidential debate between President Donald J. Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. Tonight's debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. It is conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Commission's health security advisor. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, boos, or other interruptions, except right now, as we welcome to the stage former Vice President Joe Biden and President Donald J. Trump. And I do want to say a very good evening to both of you. This debate will cover six major topics. At the beginning of each section, each candidate will have two minutes uninterrupted to answer my first question. The debate commission will then turn on their microphone only when it is their turn to answer. And the commission will turn it off exactly when the two minutes have expired. After that, both microphones will remain on. But on behalf of the voters, I'm going to ask you to please speak one at a time. The goal is for you to hear each other and for the American people to hear every word of what you both have to say. And so with that, if you're ready, let's start. 
And we will begin with the fight against the coronavirus. President Trump, the first question is for you. The country is heading into a dangerous new phase. More than 40,000 Americans are in the hospital tonight with COVID, including record numbers here in Tennessee. And since the two of you last shared a stage, 16,000 Americans have died from COVID. So please be specific. How would you lead the country during this next stage of the coronavirus crisis? Two minutes uninterrupted. So as you know, 2.2 million people modeled out were expected to die. We closed up the greatest economy in the world in order to fight this horrible disease that came from China. It's a worldwide pandemic. It's all over the world. You see the spikes in Europe and many other places right now. Uh, if you notice, the mortality rate is down 85 percent. Uh, the excess mortality rate is way down and much lower than almost any other country. And we're fighting it, and we're fighting it hard. There is a spike. There was a spike in Florida, and it's now gone. There was a very big spike in Texas. It's now gone. There was a very big spike in Arizona. It's now gone. And there are some spikes and surges in other places. They will soon be gone. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks, and it's going to be delivered. We have uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is the military is going to distribute the vaccine. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, I was in the hospital, I had it, and I got better. And I will tell you that uh, I had something that they gave me, a therapeutic, I guess they would call it. Some people could say it was a cure. But uh, I was in for a short period of time, and I got better very fast, or I wouldn't be here tonight. And now they say I'm immune, whether it's four months or a lifetime, nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. Uh, more and more people are getting better. We have uh, a problem that's a worldwide problem. This is a worldwide problem. But I've been congratulated by the heads of many countries on what we've been able to do. Uh, with the, if you, if you take a look at what we've done in terms of goggles and masks and gowns and everything else, and in particular ventilators, we're now making ventilators all over the world, thousands and thousands a month, distributing them all over the world. It will go away, and as I say, we're rounding the turn, we're rounding the corner. It's going away. Okay, former Vice President Biden, to you, how would you lead the country out of this crisis? You have two minutes uninterrupted. 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially. Anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. We're in a situation where there are a thousand deaths a day now, a thousand deaths a day, and there are over 70,000 new cases per day. Compared to what's going on in Europe, as the New England Medical Journal said, they're starting from a very low rate. We're starting from a very high rate. The expectation is we'll have another 200,000 Americans dead between now and the end of the year. If we just wore these masks, the president's own advisors have told him, we could save 100,000 lives. And we're in a circumstance where the president thus far and still has no plan, no comprehensive plan. What I would do is make sure we have everyone encouraged to wear a mask all the time. I would make sure we move in the direction of rapid testing, investing in rapid testing. I would make sure that we set up national standards as to how to open up schools and open up businesses so they can be safe and give them the wherewithal, the financial resources to be able to do that. We're in a situation now where the New England Medical Journal, one of the serious, most serious journals in the, in the whole world, said for the first time ever that this, the way this president has responded to this crisis has been absolutely tragic. And so, folks, I will take care of this. I will end this. I will make sure we have a plan. President Trump, I'd like to follow up with you and your comments. You talked about taking a therapeutic. I assume you're referencing Regeneron. You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is, not a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks, and it will be distributed very quickly. Can you tell us which companies? 
Uh, Johnson & Johnson is doing very well, Moderna is doing very well, Pfizer is doing very well, and we have numerous others. And then we also have others that we're working on very closely with other countries, in particular Europe. Let me follow up with you, and because this is new information, you have said a vaccine is coming soon, within weeks now. Your own officials say it could take well into 2021 at the earliest for enough Americans to get vaccinated. And even then, they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No. No, I think my timeline is going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up, one in particular that's the head of logistics, and this is a very easy distribution for him. He's ready to go as soon as we have the vaccine, and we expect to have 100 million vials. As soon as we have the vaccine, he's ready to go. Vice President Biden, your reaction, and just 40 percent of Americans say they would definitely agree to take a coronavirus vaccine if it was approved by the government. What steps would you take to give Americans confidence in a vaccine if it were approved? Make sure it's totally transparent. Have the scientists of the world see it, know it, look at it, go through all the processes. And by the way, He's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan, and there's no prospect that there's going to be a vaccine available for the majority of the American people before the middle of next year. President Trump, your reaction, he says you have no plan. I don't think we're going to have a dark winter and at all. We're opening up our country. We've learned and studied and understand the disease, which we didn't at the beginning. When I closed and banned China from coming in heavily infected and then ultimately Europe, but China was in January. Months later, he was saying I was xenophobic. I did it too soon. Now he's saying, oh, I should have, uh, I should have you know, moved quicker. But he didn't move quicker. He was months behind me, many months behind me. And frankly, he ran the H1N1 swine flu, and it was a total disaster, far less lethal, but it was a total disaster. Had that had this kind of numbers, 700,000 people would be dead right now, but it was a far less lethal disease. Uh, look, his own person who ran that for him, who, as you know, was his uh, chief of staff, said, it was catastrophic. It was horrible. We didn't know what we were doing. Now he comes up and he tells us how to do this. Also, everything that he said about the way every single move that he said we should make, that's what we've done. We've done all of it. But he was way behind us. Vice President Biden, your response? My response is he is xenophobic, but not because he shut down access from China. And he did it late after 40 countries had already done that. In addition to that, what he did, he made sure that we had 44 people that were in there in China trying to get to Wuhan to determine what exactly the source was. What did the president say in January? He said, no, he said, this is, he's being transparent. The president of China is being transparent. We owe him a debt of gratitude. We, ought to, we have to thank him. And, and then what happened was we started talking about using the Defense Act to make sure we go out and get whatever is needed out there to protect people. And again, I go back to this. He had nothing. He did virtually nothing. And then he gets out of the hospital and he talks about where this is. Oh, don't worry. It's all going to be over soon. Come on. There's not another serious scientist in the world who thinks it's going to be over soon. President Trump, your reaction? I say over soon. I say we're learning to live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the, <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace, but he has this thing about living in a basement. People can't do that. By the way, I, as the president, couldn't do that. I'd love to put myself in the basement or in a beautiful room in the White House and go away for a year and a half until it disappears. I can't do that. And Kirsten, every, t every meeting I had, every meeting I had, and I'd meet a lot of families, including Gold Star families and military families, every meeting I had, and I had to meet them. I had to. It would be horrible to have canceled everything. I said, you know, this is dangerous. And you catch it. And, you know, I caught it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Great doctors, great hospitals. And now I recovered. 99.9 of young people recover. 99% of people recover. We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We have to open our school, and we can't close up our nation, or you're not going to have a nation. 
And of course, the CDC has said young people can get sick with COVID-19 and can pass it. Vice President Biden, I want to talk broadly about strategy, though. You have I respond to that? 30 seconds, please, so 30 and then seconds. I have a question. No, number one, he says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it because he has never said, you see, you said it's dangerous. When's the last time? Is it really dangerous still? Are we dangerous? You tell the people it's dangerous now? Well, what should they do about the danger? And you say, I take no responsibility. Let me talk about your two. Excuse me, I take, very full, I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that it came here. It's China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that it came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from coming out to the world, including Europe and ourselves. Vice President Biden. The fact is that when we knew it was coming, when it hit, what happened? What did the president say? He said, don't worry, it's going to go away. Be gone by Easter. Don't worry. The warm weather. Don't worry. Maybe inject bleach. He said he was kidding when he said that. But a lot of people thought it was serious. A whole range of things the president has said. Even today, he thinks we are in control. We're about to lose 200,000 more people. President Trump. Look, perhaps just to finish this, uh, I was kidding on that. But just to finish this, uh, when I closed, he said I shouldn't have closed. And that went on for months. What Nancy Pelosi said the same thing. She was dancing on the streets in Chinatown in San Francisco. But when I closed, he said, this is a terrible thing, you're xenophobic. I think he called me racist, even, and because I was closing it to China. Now he says I should have closed it earlier. It just, Joe, it doesn't work. I didn't say either of those things. You certainly did. You certainly did. I, did. I okay. talked about a xenophobia in a different context. It wasn't about closing the border to Chinese coming to the United States. All right, I want to talk about both of your different strategies to handle. He thought this. I shouldn't have closed the border. Well, let's, That's obvious. Is that, do you want to respond to that quickly, Vice President no. Biden? Okay. Let's talk about your different strategies toward dealing with this. Mr. Vice President, you suggested you would support new shutdowns if scientists recommended it. What do you say to Americans who are fearful that the cost of shutdowns, the impact on the economy, the higher rates of hunger, depression, domestic and substance abuse outweighs the risk of exposure to the virus? What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. It's his ineptitude that caused the, virus, caused the country to have to shut down in large part. Why businesses have gone under, why schools are closed, why so many people have lost their living, and why they're concerned. Those other concerns are real. That's why he should have been, instead of in a sand trap in his golf course, he should have been negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats and Republicans about what to do about the acts they were passing for billions of dollars to make sure people had the capacity. But you haven't ruled out more shutdowns. Oh, well, no, I, I'm not shutting down the name, but there are, look, they need standards. The standard is if you have a reproduction rate in a community that's above a certain level, everybody says, slow up, more social distancing, do not open bars and do not open gymnasiums, do not open until you get this under control, under more control. But when you do open, give the people the capacity to be able to open and have the capacity to do it safely. For example, schools. Schools, they need a lot of money to open. They need to deal with ventilation systems. They need to deal with smaller classes, more teachers, more pods. And he's refused to support that money, or at least up to now. Let's talk about schools. President well, Trump, I, I you... think we have to respond, if I might. Please, and then I have a follow-up. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Look, all he does is talk about shutdowns, but forget about him. His Democrat governors, Cuomo in New York, you look at what's going on in California, you look at Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Democrats, Democrats all, they're shut down so tight, and they're dying. They're dying. And he supports all these people. All he talks about is shutdowns. No, we're not going to shut down, and we have to open our schools. And it's like, as an example, I have a young son. He also tested positive. By the time I spoke to the doctor the second time, he was fine. It just went away. Young people, 
I guess it's their immune system. Let me follow up with you, President Trump. You've demanded schools open in person and insist they can do it safely. But just yesterday, Boston became the latest city to move its public school system entirely online after a coronavirus spike. What is your message to parents who worry that sending their children to school will endanger not only their kids, but also their teachers and okay. families? I want to open the schools. Uh, the transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small. But I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive country with a massive economy. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often, the cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. Vice and that's what's happening. And he wants to close down, he'll close down the country if one person in our, in our massive bureaucracy says we should close it down. Vice President Biden, your Simply response. Simply not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open, but would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide the, all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what we're going to make sure that we open safely. And by the way, all you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. President Trump, let me follow up with you quickly. By the way, um, I will say this. If you go and look at what's happened to New York, it's a ghost town. It's a ghost town. And when you talk about plexiglass, these are restaurants that are dying. These are businesses with no money. Putting a plexiglass is unbelievably expensive, and it's not the answer. I mean, you're going to sit there in a cubicle wrapped around with plastic. It's These are businesses that are dying, Joe. You can't do that to people. You Which just you can't. Can Take a look at New York and what's happened to my wonderful city for, for so many years. I loved it. It was vibrant. It's dying. Everyone's leaving New York. Take a look Vice at President what Biden. New York has done in terms of the turning the curve down in terms of the number of people dying. And I don't look at this in terms of the way he does. Blue states and red states. They're all the United States. And look at the states that are having such a spike in the coronavirus. They're the red states. They're the states in the Midwest. They're the states in the upper Midwest. That's where the spike is occurring significantly. But they're all Americans. They're all Americans. And what we have to do is say, wear these masks, number one, make sure we get the help that the businesses need that has money's already been passed to do that. It's been out there since the beginning of the summer, and nothing's happened. President, New York has lost more than 40,000 people, 11,000 people in nursing homes. President Trump, what when about— When you say spike, take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, where they've had it closed. Take a look at what's happening with your friend in Michigan, where her husband's the only one allowed to do anything. It's been like a prison. Now it was just ruled unconstitutional. Take a look at North Carolina. They're having spikes, and they've been closed, and they're getting killed financially. We can't let that happen, Joe. You can't let that happen. We have to open up, and we understand the disease. We have to protect our seniors. We have to protect our elderly. We have to protect especially our seniors with heart problems and diabetes problems, and we will protect them. We have the best testing in the world by far. That's why we have so many cases. Let me follow up with you jokes. before we move on to our next section. President Trump, this week you called Dr. Anthony Fauci the nation's best-known infectious disease expert, quote, a disaster. You described him and other medical experts as, quote, idiots. If you're not listening to them, who are you listening to? Let, I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. I get along very well with Anthony. But he did say, don't wear masks. He did say, as you know, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, I think he's a Democrat, but that's okay. He said, this is not going to be a problem. We are not going to have a problem at all. When Joe says that I said, Anthony Fauci said, and others, and many others, and I'm not knocking him a lot. Nobody knew. Look, nobody knew what this thing was. Nobody knew where it was coming from, what it was. We've learned a lot. But Anthony said, don't wear masks. Now he wants to wear masks. Anthony also said, 
If you look back, exact words, here's his exact words. This is no problem. This is going to go away soon. So he's allowed to make mistakes. He happens to be a good person. Vice President right. Biden, your response quickly, and then we're going to move on to the next section. My response is that think about what the president knew in January and didn't tell the American people. He was told this was a serious virus that spread in the air, and it was much worse than, much worse than the flu. He went on record and said to one of your colleagues, record it, that in fact he knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us, Americans don't panic. He panicked. But guess what? In the meantime, we find out in the New York Times the other day that, in fact, his folks went to Wall Street and said, this is a really dangerous thing. And a memo out of that meeting, not from his administration, but from some of the brokers, said, sell short, because we've got to get moving. It's a dangerous problem. Well, this is I'm going to give you 30 I, seconds to respond, and then we're going to move Street, on. I don't know. Somebody went to Wall Street. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. Jay, I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made, Joe. I could raise so much more money as president and as somebody that knows most of those people. I could call the heads of Wall Street, the heads of every company in America. I would blow away every record, but I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. And then you bring up Wall Street. You shouldn't be bringing up Wall Street because you're the one that takes the money from Wall Street, not me. My I, could, average I could blow away your records that, like you wouldn't believe. We don't need money. We have plenty of money. In fact, we beat Hillary Clinton with a tiny fraction of the money that she was able to. All right, to. gentlemen, we're going to move on. Don't tell me about Average we're contribution, gonna... $43. All right, we're going to move on to our next section, which is national security. And I do want to start with the security of our elections and some breaking news from overnight. Just last night, top intelligence officials confirmed again that both Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. Both countries have obtained U.S. voter registration information, these officials say, and Iran sent intimidating messages to Florida voters. This question goes to you, Mr. Vice President. What would you do to put an end to this threat? You have two minutes uninterrupted. I made it clear, and I ask everyone else to take the pledge, I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. They will pay a price if I'm elected. They're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Putin about it. I don't think he's stalking them a lot. I don't think he said a word. I don't know why he hadn't said a word to Putin about it. And I don't know what he has recently said, if anything, to the Iranians. My guess is he'd probably be more outspoken with regard to the Iranians. But the point is this, folks. We are in a situation where we have foreign Company, countries trying to interfere in the outcome of our election. His own, own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy, well, I, won't, I shouldn't, well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani, he's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian, that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that. Everything that's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. President Trump, same question to you. Let me, let me ask the yeah. question. You're going to have two minutes yeah. to respond. For two elections in a row now, there has been substantial interference from foreign adversaries. What would you do in your next term to put an end to this? Two minutes uninterrupted. Well, let me respond to the first part, as Joe answered. Joe got $3.5 million from Russia, and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife. And you got three and a half million dollars. Your family got three and a half million dollars. And, you know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half. I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. Now, about your thing last night, I knew all about that. And through John, who is John Retliff, who is fantastic, DNI, he said, the one thing that's common to both of them, 
They both want you to lose, because there has been nobody tougher to Russia with, between the sanctions. Nobody tougher than me on Russia. Between the sanctions, between all of what I've done with NATO, you know, I've got the NATO countries to put up an extra $130 billion, going to $420 billion a year. That's to guard against Russia. I sold, while he was selling pillows and sheets, I sold tank busters to Ukraine. There has been nobody tougher than, on Russia than Donald Trump. And I'll tell you, they were so bad. They took over the, the submarine port, you remember that very well, during your term, during you and Barack Obama. They took over a big part of what should have been Ukraine. You handed it to them. But you were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. But now, with what came out today, it's even worse. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails of the kind of money that you were raking in, you and your family. And Joe, you were vice president when some of this was happening, and it should have never happened. And I think you owe an explanation to the American people. Why is it? Somebody just had a news conference a little while ago who was essentially supposed to work with you and your family. But what he said was damning. And Regardless of me, I think you have to clean it up and talk to the American people. Maybe you can do it right now. Vice President Biden, you may respond. Be straight here. And then I do I, want to follow up on the election security. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever, number one. Number two, this is a president, I have released all of my tax returns, 22 years, go look at them, 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? President Trump, your response. First of all, I called my accountants, underwrote it. I'm going to release them as soon as we can. I want to do it. And it'll show how successful, how great this company is, but much more importantly than that, people were saying $750. I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Tens over the last number of years, tens of millions of dollars I prepaid because at some point they think it's an estimate, they think I may have to pay tax, so I already prepaid it. Nobody told me that. Did your account Nobody tell told you, you that. You Excuse them? me. And it wasn't written whenever they write this. They keep talking about $750, which I think is a filing fee. But let me just tell you, I prepaid millions and millions of dollars in taxes, number one. Number two, I don't make money from China. You do. I don't make money from Ukraine. You do. I don't make money from Russia. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. Your son said we have to give 10 percent to the big man. Joe, what's that all about? It's terrible. All right, gentlemen, I want to ask you both some questions about all of this. But I'm going to let you both respond very quickly. You just said you spoke to your accountant yes. about potentially releasing your taxes. Did he tell you when you can release them? Do you as have a the deadline for when you're going to release them? I from get American treated people? worse than the Tea Party got treated because I have a lot have of people in there. Okay. Deep down in the IRS, they treat me horribly. We made a deal, it was all settled until I decide to run for president. I get treated very badly by the IRS, very unfairly. But we had a deal all done. As soon as we're completed with the deal, I want to release it. But I have paid millions and millions of dollars, and I, it's worse than paying. I paid in advance. It's called prepaying your taxes. Okay. I paid in advance. I want to ask you both about questions regarding your potential foreign entanglements and questions that have been raised to give you both a chance Some to talk about this more this. broadly. Respond very quickly, and then I'll get to my question. Why did he, he's been saying this for four years? Show us. Just show us. Stop playing around. 
You've been saying for four Everybody years you're going to reduce your taxes. Nobody knows, Mr. President. What they do okay. know is you're not paying your taxes or you're paying taxes that are so low. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I know how to game the system. Come on. Come on, folks. So, and President Trump, and then I want to get to two questions to both of you sure. on this. I was put through a phony witch hunt for three years. It started before I even got elected. They spied on my campaign. No president should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me just say this. Mueller and 18 angry Democrats and FBI agents all over the place spent $48 million. They went through everything I had, including my tax returns, and they found absolutely no collusion and nothing wrong. $48 million. I guarantee you, if I spent $1 million on you, Joe, I could find plenty wrong, because right. the kind of things that you've done and the kind of monies that your family has taken, I mean, your brother made money in Iraq, me... millions of dollars. Your other bro brother made a fortune, and it's all through you, Joe, and they say you get some of it, and you do live very well. You have houses all over the place. You live very well. <laughs> all right, gentlemen, let me just ask oh, some goodness. questions about all of this broadly. Vice President Biden, there have been questions about the work your son has done in China and for a Ukrainian energy company when you were vice president. In retrospect, was anything about those relationships inappropriate or unethical? Nothing was unethical. Here's what the deal. With regard to Ukraine, we had this whole question about whether or not, because he was on the board, I later learned of a Burisma, a company, that somehow I had done something wrong. Yet every single solitary person when he was going through his impeachment testifying under oath who worked for him, said, I did my job impeccably. I carried out U.S. policy. Not one single solitary thing was out of line. Not a single thing, number one. Number two, the guy who got in trouble in Ukraine was this guy trying to bribe the Ukrainian government to say something negative about me, which they would not do and did not do because it never, ever, ever happened. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. I have not had, a, the only guy made money from China is this guy. He's the only one. Nobody else has made money from China. Never President Trump, deal, deal with let, China. Me, let me By ask way, my question to you. But could I just, one, one thing? Very quickly. His son didn't have a job for a long time, was sadly no longer in the military service. I won't get into that. And he didn't have a job. As soon as he became vice president, Barisma, not the best look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183,000 a month. Listen to this, 183, and they gave him a three million dollar upfront payment. All right, and he had no I, energy. I'm going to let the vice president That's respond to that quickly, and then dishonest. I need to get to a question to you. Very no quickly, basis for president. that. Everybody investigated that. No one said anything he did was wrong in Ukraine. Okay, President Trump, this is for you. Since you took office, you've never divested from your business. You've personally promoted your properties abroad. A report this week, which was referenced, does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. So how can voters know that you don't have any foreign conflicts of interest? I have many bank accounts, and they're all listed, and they're all over the place. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. The bank account you're referring to, which is everybody knows about it, it's listed. The bank account was in 2013. That's what it was. It was opened and it was closed in 2015, I believe. And then I decided, because I was going to do, I was thinking about doing a deal in China, like millions of other people. I was thinking about it, and I decided I'm not going to do it. Didn't like it. I decided not to do it. Had an account open, and I closed it. Okay. Excuse me. And then, unlike him, where he's vice president and he does business, I then decided to run for president after that. That was before. So I closed it before I even ran for president, let alone became president. Big difference. He is the vice president of the United States, and his son, his brother, and his other brother are getting rich. They're like a vacuum cleaner. They're sucking okay, up money. President every Trump, place thank you. Goes. We do Not need to true. move on. I do want to ask you, uh, Vice President Biden, about China. Let's talk about China more broadly. There have, of course, President Trump has said that they should pay for not being fully transparent in regards to the coronavirus. If you were president, would you make China pay? And please be specific, what would that look like? What I'd make China do is play by the international rules, not like he has done. He has caused the deficit of China to go up, not down. 
with China, up, not down. We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual property. You have to get a, have a partner in China. It's 51 percent. We would not do that at all, number one. Number two, we're in a situation where China would have to play by the rules internationally as well. When I met with Xi that, and uh, when I was still vice president, he said, we're setting up air identification zones in the, in the South China Sea. You can't fly through them. I said, we're going to fly through them. We just flew B-52, B-1 bombers through it. We're not going to pay attention. They have to play by the rules. And what's he do? He embraces guys like the thugs like in North Korea and, and, uh, and the Chinese president and Putin and others, and he pokes his finger in the eye of all of our friends, all of our allies. We make up only, we're, we're 25 percent, 25 percent of the world's economy. We need to be having the rest of our friends with us saying to China, these are the rules. You play by them or you're going to pay the price for not paying by them economically. That's the way I will run it. And that's what we did in upholding steel tariffs and a range of other things when we were president and vice president. All right. Let's talk about oh, North oh, Korea. Oh, oh. Let, let, Excuse me. No, I have to yes. respond to that. Okay. Very quickly, and then Sun we're going to move on to North Korea. Sun walked out with a dollars from China to not manage after true. spending 10 minutes in office and being in Air Force Two, number one. Number two. There's a very strong email talking about your family wanting to make $10 million a year for introductions. President Trump, on China Not policy, true. though, what no, specifically no, are you going to do? What specifically are you going to do to make China pay? You've said you're going to make all, them pay. First of all, China is paying. They're paying billions and billions of dollars. I just gave $28 New billion. Dollars New sanctions? I just gave $28 billion to our farmers. Taxpayers' China, money. It's what? Taxpayers' money didn't no, come no, from yeah, China. No, no, yeah, you know the taxpayers. It's called China. China Not paid true. 28 billion, and you know what they did to pay it, Joe? They devalued their currency, and they also paid up. And you know who got the money? Our farmers, our great farmers, because they were targeted. You never charged them anything. Also, I charged them 25 percent on dumped steel because they were killing our steel industry. We were not going to have a steel industry. Okay. And now we have a steel okay. industry. Okay, Vice President Biden, your response, please. My response is look. This isn't about, there's a reason why he's bringing up all this malarkey. There's a reason for it. He doesn't want to talk about the, the, the substantive issues. It's not about his family and my family. It's about your family. And your family's hurting badly. If you're making less than, if you're a middle class family, you're getting hurt badly right now. You're sitting at the kitchen table this morning deciding, well, we can't get new tires, they're bald because we have to wait another month or so. Or are we going to be able to pay the mortgage? Or who's going to tell her she can't go back to, to community college? They're the decisions you're making in the middle class families like I grew up in Scranton and Claymont. They're in trouble. We should be talking about your families, but that's the last thing he wants to talk about. I want, to, I want to talk about statement. North Korea. Excuse me, just I do want to turn to please. 10 seconds, Mr. President. That's 10 a seconds. typical political statement. Let's get off this China thing, and then he looks. The family, around the table, everything. Just right. a typical politician when I see that. Let's talk I'm about North Korea. I'm not a typical Korea politician. Okay, That's President why I got Trump. elected. That let's was, talk let's about get off the subject of China. Let's talk around, sitting around the table. All right. Come on, Joe, you can do better. We're going to talk about North Korea now. President Trump, you've met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un three times. You've talked about your beautiful letters with him. You've touted the fact that there hasn't been a war or a long-range missile test, and yet North Korea recently rolled out its biggest ever intercontinental ballistic missile and continues to develop its nuclear arsenal. Do you see that as a betrayal of the relationship you no. forged? Just 30 seconds here because we need to get on to the next So one. when I met with Barack Obama, we sat in the White House, right at the beginning, had a great conversation. It was supposed to be 15 minutes, and it was well over an hour. He said the biggest problem we have with North is North Korea. He indicated we will be in a war with North Korea. Guess what? It would be a nuclear war. And he does have plenty of nuclear capability. In the meantime, I have a very good relationship with him. Different kind of a guy, but he probably thinks the same thing about me. We have a different kind of a relationship. We have a very good relationship, and there's no war. And, you know, about oh, two months ago, he broke into a certain area. They said, oh, there's going to be trouble. I said, no, they're not, because he's not going to do that. And I was right. Look, instead of being in a war where millions of people, Seoul, you know, is 25 miles away, 
millions and millions, 32 million people in Seoul. Millions of people would be okay. dead right now. President we Trump, don't have that's a war, 30 and seconds. I have a good Thank relationship. You. Vice President Biden, to you, North Korea conducted four nuclear tests under the Obama administration. Why do you think you would be able to rein in this persistent threat? Right because now? I'd make it clear, which we were making clear to China, they had to be part of the deal because here's the re I made it clear and as a spokesperson of the administration when I went to China that they said, why are you moving your missile defense up so close? Why are you moving more forward? Forces here. Why you continue to do uh, um, uh, military maneuvers with South Korea? I said because North Korea is a problem, and we're going to continue to do it so we can control them. We're going to make sure we can control them and make sure they cannot hurt us. And so, if you want to do something about it, step up and help. If not, it's going to continue. What has he done? He's legitimized North Korea. He's talked about his good buddy, who's a thug a thug, and he talks about how we're better off. And they are, have much more capable missiles, able to reach U.S. territory much more easily than ever did before. Let me follow up with you, Vice President Biden. You've said you wouldn't meet with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get that the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear-free zone. All right, let's move on to American families. Kristen, they tried Very to quickly, meet with 10 him. Seconds, President. They tried to meet with him. He I wouldn't didn't. do it. He didn't like Obama. He didn't like him. He wouldn't do it. Okay, you know, I gotta give a him a chance to respond to that he before we move do on. It. You and know that's I... okay. You know what? North Korea, we're not in a war. We have a good relationship. You know, people don't understand. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on, other countries is a, a good of thing. We have a lot of questions to get yes, to. Not your response. Saying we had a good relationship with Hitler before he, in fact, invaded Europe, the rest of Europe. Come on. The reason he would not meet with President Obama is because President Obama said, we're going to talk about denuclearization. We're not going to legitimize you, and we're going to continue to put stronger and stronger sanctions on you. That's why he wouldn't meet with us. All right, let's and it didn't move happen. on. Let's Excuse move on me. and talk he about American families. He left me a mess, Kristen. President Trump. Okay, we they do need to move on. They left me a mess. North Korea was a mess. We and in fact, if you so remember the first two or three months, tonight, there was a very Trump. dangerous period of my first three months before we sort of worked things out a little bit. Okay. There was a very day. They left us a mess. And Obama would be, I think, the first to say it was the single biggest problem he thought that our country. OK, had. let's move on to American families and the economy. One of the issues that's most important to them is health care, as you both know. Today, there was a key vote on a new Supreme Court justice. Justice Amy Coney Barrett, and health care is at the center of her confirmation fight. Over 20 million Americans get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. It's headed to the Supreme Court, and your administration, Mr. President, is advocating for the court to overturn it. If the Supreme Court does overturn that law, those 20 million Americans could lose their health insurance almost overnight. So what would you do if those people have their health insurance taken away? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Sure. First of all, I've already done something that nobody thought was possible. Through the legislature, I terminated the individual mandate. That is the worst part of Obamacare, as we call it. The individual mandate where you have to pay a fortune for the privilege of not having to pay for bad health insurance. I terminated. It. It's gone. Now it's in court, because Obamacare is no good. But then I made a decision. Run it as well as you can to my people, great people. Run it as well as you can. I could have gone the other route and made everybody very unhappy. They ran it. Uh, premiums are down. Everything's down. Here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it, and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare, because without the individual mandate, it's much different. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new, beautiful health care. The Democrats will do it because there'll be tremendous pressure on them, and we might even have the House by that time, and I think we are going to win the House, okay? You'll see, but I think we're going to win the House. But come up with a better health care, always protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And one thing very important, we have 180 million people out there that have great private health care far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. These are people that love their health care. 
people that have been successful, middle-income people, been successful. They have 180 million plans, 180 million people, families. Under what he wants to do, which will basically be socialized medicine, he won't even have a choice, they want to terminate 180 million plans. We have done an incredible job on health care, and we're going to do even better. Okay, Let Vice President Biden, yes, this is for you. Your health care plan calls for building on Obamacare. So my question is, what is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It'll become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be, if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal, in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, the idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for with 20 candidates for the nomination was, I support private insurance. That's why I didn't, not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect pre-existing. There's no way he can protect pre-existing conditions. None. Zero. You can't do it in the ether. He's been talking about this for a long time. There is no, he's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the pre-existing condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan that we've been waiting for since 17, 18, 19, and 20. The fact, I still have a, little, a few more minutes. I know you're getting anxious. The, <laughs> the fact is that the, he's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. 10 million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions and all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? I have a follow-up for you, Vice President sure. Biden. It relates to something that President Trump said. He's accusing you of wanting socialized medicine. What do you say to people who have concerns that your health care plan, which includes a government insurance option, takes the country one step closer to a health care system run entirely by the government? What's I your response I say it's to ridiculous. It's like saying that, you know, we're uh, the idea that the fact that there's a public option that people can choose that makes it a socialist plan. Look, the difference between the president, I think health care is not a privilege, it's a right. Everyone should have the right to have affordable health care. And I am very proud of my plan. It's gotten endorsed by all the major labor unions, as well as, as well as a whole range of other people who, in fact, are concerned in the medical field. This is something that's going to save people's lives, and this is going to give some people an opportunity, an opportunity to have health care for their children. How many of you home are worried and rolling around in bed tonight wondering what in God's name you're going to do if you get sick because you've lost your home insurance, your, your, your health insurance your company's gone under? We have to provide health insurance for people at an affordable rate, and that's what I do. President Trump, Excuse me, he was your there response. for 47 years. He didn't do it. <laughs> he was now there as vice president for eight years, and it's not like it was 25 years ago. It was three and three quarters. It was just a little while ago, right? Less than four years ago. He didn't do anything. He didn't do it. He wants socialized medicine, and it's not that he wants it. His vice president, I mean, she is, is more liberal than Bernie Sanders and wants it even more. Bernie Sanders wants it. The Democrats want it. You're going to have socialized medicine, just like he went with fracking. We're not going to have fracking. We're going to stop fracking. We're going to stop fracking. Then he goes to Pennsylvania after he gets a nomination, where he got very lucky to get it. And he goes to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and he says, oh, we're going to have fracking. And you never asked that question. And by the way, so far, I respect very much the way you're handling this, I have to say. By the way. But somebody should ask the question. You can ask he, he goes for a year. There will be we no have a, fracking. We, have, there we will do be have no a number of, We have a number of topics we're no, no, going to get to. No, no, but that's a big question. We're going to get to. We're going to get to. It's the same thing with socialized medicine. I have to respond. Vice President, your response, please. My response is people deserve to have affordable health care, period. 
period, period, period. And the Biden care proposal will, in fact, provide for that affordable health care, lower premiums. And what we're going to do is going to cost some money. It's going to cost over $750 billion over 10 years to do it. And they're going to have lower premiums. You can buy into the better plans, the cheaper plans, lower your premiums, deal with un 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 unexpected billing, and have your drug prices drop significantly. He keeps talking about it. He hasn't done a thing for anybody on health care. Not a thing. Tristan, when Very he quickly, says, then I want to talk when about he says public on option, Hill. he's talking about socialized medicine and when he and, and health care. When he talks about a public option, he's talking about destroying your Medicare, totally Wrong. destroyed, and destroying your Social Security. And this whole country will come down. You know, Bernie Sanders tried it. In his state. He tried it in his state. His governor was a very liberal governor. They want to make it work. Okay. It, let's hear, it was let's let Vice impossible President Biden to respond. work. It doesn't Vice work. President He's Biden a very confused response. guy. He thinks he's running against somebody else. He's running against Joe Biden. I beat all those other people because I disagreed with them. Joe Biden he's running against. And the idea that we're in a situation that they're going to destroy Medicare, this is the guy that the actuary at Medicare said, if in fact, at Social Security, if in fact he continues to withhold his plan to withhold the tax on Social Security, Social Security will be bankrupt in by 2023 with no way to make up for it. This is the guy who's tried to cut Medicare. So I don't, I mean, the idea that Donald Trump is lecturing me on Social Security and Medicare, come on. He tried to get Ten rid seconds, of, he Mr. tried President, to hurt Social to Security to years question. ago, years ago. Go back and look at the records. He tried to hurt Social Security years ago. All One right, thing. let's move but on. This I'm going to move on. Let me, they Mr. President, I have to move week, on to the next question. They say the stock market will boom if I'm elected. If he's elected, the stock market will crash. Okay, let's move right. on to the next question that. very quickly. Look. The idea that the stock market is booming is his only measure of what's happening. Where I come from in Scranton and Claymont, the people don't live off of the stock market. Just in the, uh, just in the last three, uh, three years during this crisis, the, the billionaires in this country made, according to the Wall Street, 700 billion more dollars. 700 billion more dollars, because that's his only measure. What happens to the ordinary people out there? What happens to them? Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill. We're, we're going to move on. 401ks gentlemen. are through the roof. We're going to move stock on. Stock are through the roof. Right. And he doesn't come from Scranton. That's like one of the, he lived there for a short period gonna, of time before okay, he even knew we're it. We're going to move on to the next left. question. And the people of Pennsylvania Let me will move show on to my that. next question, they gentlemen. Understand. As of tonight, more than 12 million people are out of work. And as of tonight, 8 million more Americans have fallen into poverty and more families are going hungry every day. Those hit hardest are women and people of color. They see Washington fighting over a relief bill. Mr. President, why haven't you been able to get them the help they need? 30 seconds here. Because Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve it. I do. But you're the president. I do, but I still have to get, unfortunately. That's one of the reasons I think we're going to take over the House because of her. Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve anything because she'd love to have some victories on a date called November 3rd, Nancy Pelosi does not want to approve it. We are ready, willing, and able to do something. Don't forget, we've already approved three plans, and it's gone through, including the Democrats, in all fairness. This one she doesn't want. It's near the election because she thinks it helps her politically. I think it hurts her politically. All right, Mr. Vice way, President, you know, The Republican leader in, a, in, the, in the United States Senate said he can't pass it. He will not be able to pass it. He does not have Republican votes. Why isn't he talking to his Republican friends? Let me follow up with you, Vice President Biden. If we made a Biden, deal, because the let me let me ask Vice it. President Biden a question. You are the leader of the Democratic Party. Why have you not pushed the Democrats to get a deal for the American people? Well, I have, and they have pushed it. Look, they passed this act all the way back in the beginning of the summer. This is like it's not new. It's been out there. This Heroes Act has been sitting there. And look at what's happening. When I was in charge of the Recovery Act with $800 billion, I was able to get $145 billion to local communities that have to balance their budgets and states that have to balance their budgets, so they didn't have to fire, fire, they have to fire firefighters, teachers, first responders, law enforcement officers, so they could keep their cities and counties running. He will not support that. They have not done a thing for them. And Mitch McConnell said, let them go bankrupt. Let him go bankrupt. Come on. What's the matter the with this? The bill that guys? was passed in the House was a bailout of badly run, high crime, Democrat 
all run by Democrats, cities and states. It was a way of getting a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars to these states. It was also a way of getting a lot of money from our people's pockets to people that come into our country illegally. We were going to take care of everything for them. And what that does, and I'd love to do that, I'd love to help them, but what that does, everybody all over the world will start pouring into our country. We can't do it. This was a way of taking care of them. This was a way of spending on things that had nothing to do with COVID, as per your question. But it was really a big bailout for badly run Democrat cities and states. All right, By the way, I wanna... if I get elected, I'm not going to, I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I'm going to be an American president. I don't see red states and blue states. What I see is American. American, United States. And folks, every single state out there finds themselves in trouble. They're going to start laying off, whether they're red or blue, cops, firefighters, first responders, because teachers, because they have to balance their budget. And the founders were smart. They allowed the federal government to deficit spend to compensate for the United States of America. I want to talk about the minimum wage, gentlemen. Mr. Yes. Vice President, we are talking a lot about struggling small businesses yes. and business owners these days. Do you think this is the right time to ask them to raise the minimum wage? You, of course, support a $15 federal minimum wage. I do, because I think one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bail them out, too. We should be bailing them out now, those small businesses. You got one in six of them going under. They're not going to be able to make it back. They passed a, pre a, a package that allows us to be able to call PPP. Money is supposed to go to help them do everything from organize how they can deal with their businesses being open safely. D d schools, how they can make classrooms smaller, how they can hire more teachers, how they can put ventilation systems in. They need the help. The businesses as well as the schools need the help. But this, these guys will not help them. It's not giving them any of the money. We are going to move Susan, on to immigration, one, one thing very but quickly, I want to get your reaction. He said we have reaction. to help our small businesses by raising the minimum wage. That's not helping. Uh, I think it should be a state option. Alabama is different than New York. New York is different from Vermont. Every state is different. It should be a state you, option. You said very we recently. Have to help. It's very important. We have to help our small businesses. You, you How said, are you helping your small businesses when you're forcing wages? What's going to happen and what's been proven to happen is when you do that, these small businesses fire many of their employees. You said Not very true, recently you would consider way. raising the federal minimum wage to $15 Say an hour. It. You said recently you would consider raising the federal minimum wage to $15 I, an really hour. Like, is that still the case? And I would consider it. In a, to an extent, but in what I really like, what I re, in a second administration, but not to a level that's going to put all these businesses out of business. It should be a state option. Look, every I've lived in different places, I know different places. They're all different. Some places, fifteen dollars is not so bad. In other places, other states, fifteen dollars. Okay, would be President ruined. Trump. Thank no, you. Quick no response, Vice President Biden. Two jobs, one job, be below poverty. People are making six, seven, eight bucks an hour. These first responders, we all clap for as they come down the street because they've allowed us to make it. What's happening? They deserve a minimum wage of $15. Anything below that puts you below the poverty level. And there is no evidence that when you raise the minimum wage, businesses go out of business. That is simply not true. We're going to talk about immigration. Saw. We're going to talk about immigration now, gentlemen. And we're going to talk about families within this context. Mr. President, your administration separated children from their parents at the border, at least 4,000 kids. You've since reversed your zero tolerance policy, but the United States can't locate the parents of more than 500 children. So how will these families ever be reunited? Uh, children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people, cartels, and they're brought here and they used to use them to get into our country. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. You see the numbers and we let people in, but they have to come in legally and they come in through. But merit. how will you reunite these kids you, with their families, Mr. President? Let me just tell you, Mr. they built cages. You know, they used to say, I built the cages. And then they had a picture in a certain newspaper. And it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, look at these cages. President Trump built them. And then it was determined they were built in 2014. That was him. Do you they have a plan cages. to reunite the kids? Yes, we're working families? on it very, we're, we're trying very hard. But a lot of these kids come out without the parents. They come over through cartels and through coyotes and through gangs. Vice President Biden, let me bring you into this conversation. Quick response and then another question to you. These 500 plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. 
Bay, real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot, it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Kristen, they did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not. They built the cages. The, they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, Let's Joe. talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. It's criminal. It's criminal. Let me ask Kristen, you about I will say this. In they went down. We brought reporters, everything. They are so well taken care of. They're in facilities that were so clean. But some of them haven't been reunited. Good. But just families. ask one question. Who built the cages? I'd love you to ask him that. Who built the cages? Let me ask about your immigration policy, Mr. Vice President. The Obama administration did fail to deliver immigration reform, which had been a key promise during the administration. It also presided over record deportations as well as family detentions at the border before changing course. So why should voters trust you with an immigration overhaul now? Because it made a mistake. It, made too, it took too long to get it right. It took too long to get it right. I'll be president of the United States, not vice president of the United States. And the fact is, I've made it very clear. Within 100 days, I'm going to send to the United States Congress a pathway to citizenship for over 11 million undocumented people. And all of those so-called dreamers, those DACA kids, they're going to be immediately certified again to be able to stay in this country and put on a path to citizenship. The idea that they are being sent home by this guy and they want to do that is they've gone to a country they've never seen before. I can imagine you're five years old, your parents are taking you across the, the Rio Grande River and it's, and, it's, and it's illegal. And you say, oh no, mom, leave me here. I'm not going to go with you. They've been here. Many of them are model citizens. Over 20,000 of them are first responders out there taking care of people during this crisis. We owe them. We owe them. President Kristen, Trump, he had reaction. eight years to do what he said he was going to do. And I've changed without having a specific. We got rid of catch and release. We got rid of a lot of horrible things that they put in and that they lived with. But he had eight years he was vice president. He did nothing except build cages to keep children in. Vice President Wrong. Biden, your response. The catch and release. You know what he's talking about there? If, in fact, you had a family came across and they were arrested. They, in fact, were given a date to show up for their hearing. They were released. And guess what? They showed up for a hearing. And this is the first president in the history of the United States of America that's anybody seeking asylum has to do it in another country. That's never happened before in America. That's never happened before in America. You come to the United States and you make your case that I seek asylum based on the following, on the following premise, why I deserve it under American law. They're sitting in squalor on the other side of the river. President Trump, uh, your response, so 30 important. seconds, and then we'll move It on. just shows that he has no understanding of immigration or the laws. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in, a rapist would come in, a very bad person would come in. We would take their name. We have to release them into our country. And then you say they come back. Less than 1% of the people come back. We have to send ICE out and Border Patrol out to find them. We would say, come back in two years, three years. We're going to give you a court case. You need Perry Mason. We're going to give you a court case. When you say they come back, they don't come back, Joe. Yeah. They never come back. Only the really, I hate to say this, but those with the lowest IQ, they might come back. Okay, President Trump, very, let's very give few. Vice President Biden a chance to respond, and then we're going to move on to the you next section. You don't know section. the law, Joe. Vice President Biden, law. your response. Know the law. What he's telling you is simply not true. Well, check, check it, it out. out. They don't come back. Check it out. All right, let's move on. But we don't have to, to worry about section. it because they terminated it. So we don't have to worry about let's it. Let's move right. on to the next section. You have 525 section. kids not knowing where in God's name they're going to be and lost their parents. Go ahead. All right. Let's talk about our next section, which is race in America. And I want to talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. Part of that experience is something called the talk. 
It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. I do. You know, my daughter is a social worker, and uh, she's, all, she's written a lot about this. She has a graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania in social work. And you know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90 percent African-American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't, I never had to tell my daughter if she's pulled over. Make sure she puts, for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child when you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street. Making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel, because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300000 child of a $300,000 a year person or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. And we have always said, we've never lived up to it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. Well, guess what? We have never, ever lived up to it, but we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion, not exclusion. This is the first president to come along and says, that's the end of that. We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. President Trump, same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, he's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community, and they were called, and he called them super predators. And he said that, he said it, super predators. And they have never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. They might have wanted to do it, but if you had to see the arms I had to twist to get that done, it was not a pretty picture. And everybody knows it, including some very liberal people that cried in my office. They cried in the Oval Office. Two weeks later, they're out saying, gee, we have to defeat him. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, Opportunity Zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina. He came in with this incredible idea for Opportunity Zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities, and then historically black colleges and universities. After three years of coming to the office, I love some of those guys, they were great. They came into the office, and they said, I said, what are you doing? After three years, I said, why do you keep coming back? Because we have no funding. I said, you don't have to come back every year. We have to come back. Because President Obama would never give them long-term funding. And I did. Ten-year, long-term funding. And I gave them more money than they asked for. Because they said, I think you need more. And I said, the only bad part about this is I may never see you again. Because I got very friendly with them. And they like me and I like them. But I saved it. Colleges and universities. Okay, and we're going to talk about both of your records, but your response to that, Vice President. My response to that is I never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. 
and go on my website, get the quote, the date when he said it. Not enough people. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Look, and talk about he, granted, he did in fact let 20 people, he commuted 20 people sentences. We commuted over a thousand people sentences, over a thousand. The very law he's talking about is a law that in fact initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation, not to jail. We should fundamentally change the system, and that's what I'm going to do. But why didn't he do it four years ago? Why didn't you do that four years ago, even less than that? Why didn't you I do it? You were vice president. You keep talking about all these things you're going to do, and you're going to do this. But you were there just a short time ago, and you guys did nothing. We did. You know, Joe, I, I ran because of you. I ran because of Barack Obama, because you did a poor job. If I thought you did a good job, I would have never run. Uh, I would have never run. <laughs> I ran because of you. I'm looking at you now. You're a politician. I ran because of you. All right, Vice President Biden, your response to that, and then I do have some uh, questions for both of you. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, I hope he does look at me, because what's happening here is you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am, the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some follow-up. Excuse me. Please respond, if and then we're going to have follow-up questions. this is true about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq, if this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody. Take President the Trump, I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of race. Me. We're Take talking about the, the issue. Take laptop from hell. President Trump, Nobody. We're, we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, you've I have just... to respond to that. Please. Because look, Very there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plan. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And you that's got exactly it. what, is this that's where you're exactly going? what This is going. where he's going. The laptop right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia? I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President, again with Russia. We're going to continue Boy, on the issue of race. Mr. President, you've described one. the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife? Well, you have to understand, the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting, pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. As far as uh, my relationships with all people, I think I have great relationships with all people. I am the least racist person in this room. Well, what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that rhetoric? I don't know. I mean, I don't videos. know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done and prison reform and opportunity zones. I took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. They can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very, it makes me sad because I am, I, I am the least racist person. I can't even see the audience because it's so dark, but I don't care who's in the audience. I'm the least racist person in this room. Okay, Vice President Biden, Abraham, let me ask you very quickly and then I have a follow-up question for you. Please. Abraham Lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. 
Every single one. He started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys, last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. Come on. This guy is a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. President Trump, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to respond, and then I have a follow-up. You know, he made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're Abraham that, Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody right. done what I've done for the black community. And I'm saying I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody done what I've done for the black community. Now you have done nothing other than the crime bill which put oh God. Th tens of thousands of black men mostly in jail. All right, let me, you know let what? Me, let me they ask remember Vice it President because Biden if you look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they Vice remember President that Biden you treated them very, very badly. The, Just the, take a look at what's happening out there. Vice President Biden, let me give you a chance to respond within this context. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. They are sons, they are brothers, their fathers, their uncles, whose families are still to this day, some of them suffering the consequences. So speak to those families. Why should they vote for you? One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100 percent, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money on. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment, treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done, because I think maybe the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to the drug. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay. why so, didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Why didn't he get it done? That's uh, what I'm going to do when I become president. You were vice president, along with Obama as your president, your leader, for eight years. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years to get it done. Now you're saying you're going to get it done because you're all talk and no action, Jim. We got your a lot response. of it done. We released 38,000 38, prisoners left from the— You got out, nothing done. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have—there were over 1,000 people who were given clemency. We have made, in fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. That's why— I I'm running to win back that election and change his terrible policy. I just asked, and then we're I just asked one question. Why didn't you do it in the eight years, a short time ago? Why didn't you do it? You just said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. You put tens because of thousands of mostly black young men in prison. Now you're saying you're going to get, you're going to undo that. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years with Obama. Because you know why, Joe? Because you're all talk. And no action. All right, Vice President because Biden, and then we're going to move on to the next section. We had a Republican Congress. That's the answer. Well, you okay. Gotta talk, you got to talk them into it, Joe. Sometimes All right. You got to talk them into it. We're going to move on to our next yeah. section. Like which I did is with criminal change. justice reform. Oh, yeah. okay. I had to talk Democrats into Gentlemen, it. Gentlemen, you did. We're, we're, we're running out of done. time, so we got to get on to okay. climate change, please. You both have very different visions on climate change. President Trump, you say that environmental regulations have hurt jobs in the energy sector. Vice President Biden, you have said you see addressing climate change as an opportunity to create new jobs. For each of you, how would you? both combat climate change and support job growth at the same time, starting with you, President Trump. You have two minutes uninterrupted. So uh, we have the Trillion Trees program. We have so many different programs. I do love the environment, but what I want is the cleanest crystal clear water, the cleanest air. We have the best lowest number in carbon emissions, which is a big standard that I notice Obama goes with all the time. Not Joe. I haven't heard Joe use the term because I'm not sure he knows what it represents or means, but I have heard Obama use it. And we have the best 
carbon emission numbers that we've had in 35 years under this administration. We are working so well with industry. But here's what we can't do. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia. Look at India. It's filthy. The, the air is filthy. The Paris Accord, I took us out because we were going to have to spend trillions of dollars, and we were treated very unfairly. When they put us in there, they did us a great disservice. They were going to take away our businesses. I will not sacrifice tens of millions of jobs, thousands and thousands of companies because of the Paris Accord. It was so unfair. China doesn't kick in until 2030. Russia goes back to a low standard, and we kicked in right away. It would have been, it would have been, it would have destroyed our businesses. So, you ready? We have done an incredible job environmentally. We have the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the best carbon emission standards that we've seen in many, many years. Vice President, and we Biden. haven't destroyed our industries. Vice President Biden, two minutes to you, uninterrupted. Climate change and climate warming, the global warming, is an existential threat to humanity. We have a moral obligation to deal with it. And we're told by all the leading scientists in the world, we don't have much time. We're going to pass the point of no return within the next eight to ten years. Four more years of this man eliminating all the regulations that were put in by us to clean up the climate, to clean up, to limit the, the uh, uh, limit of emissions will put us in a position where we're going to be in real trouble. Here's where we have a great opportunity. I was able to get both all the environmental organizations as well as labor, the people worried about jobs, to support my climate plan. Because what it does, it will create millions of new good paying jobs. We're going to invest in, for example, 500,000 50,000, excuse me, 50,000 charging stations on our highways so that we can own the electric car market of the future. In the meantime, China is doing that. We're going to be in a position where we're going to see to it that we're going to take 4 million existing billion buildings and 2 million existing homes and retrofit them so they don't leak as much energy, saving hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in the process and creating significant number of jobs. And by the way, the whole idea of what this is all going to do, it's going to create millions of jobs and it's going to clean the environment. Our health and our jobs are at stake. That's what's happening. And what right now, by the way, Wall Street firms indicated that my plan, my my plan will in fact create 18.6 million jobs, 7 million more than his. This is from Wall Street. And I'll create one trillion dollars more in economic growth than his proposal does. Not on climate, just on the economy. President Trump, you're right. They came out and said very strongly, $6,500 will be taken away from families under his plan, that his plan is an economic disaster. If you look at what he wants to do, you know, the, if you look at his plan, no, his environmental plan, you know who developed it? AOC plus three. They know nothing about the climate. I mean, she's got a good line of stuff, but she knows nothing about the climate. And they're all hopping through hoops for AOC plus three. Look, their real plan costs $100 trillion. If we had the best year in the history of our country for 100 years, we would not even come close to a number like that. When he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because they want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. This is the craziest plan that anybody has ever seen. And this wasn't done by smart people. This wasn't done by anybody. Frankly, I don't even know how it can be good politically. Right. They want to spend $100 trillion. That's their real number. He's trying to say it was six. It's $100 trillion. They want to knock down buildings and build new buildings with little, tiny, small windows. I mean, and many other things. Okay. And many other things. Let me have the vice president respond, and we're crazy. running out of time, and we have a lot and more you'll questions to get our to. Country. So let's hear from the vice president. I have a number more questions. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know where he comes up with these numbers. A hundred trillion dollars. Give me a break. This plan was. Um, this is plan is endorsed by every major, every major environmental group, and every labor group. Labor. 
because they know the future lies. The future lies in us being able to breathe, and they know their good jobs and getting us there. And by the way, the fastest growing industry in America are, is, is, is the electric, the, uh, excuse me, uh, solar energy and wind. He thinks wind causes cancer, windmills. It's the fastest growing jobs, and they pay good prevailing wages, 45, 50 bucks an hour. We can grow and we can be cleaner if we go the route I'm proposing. President Trump, Excuse me. please we respond, energy, and then I have to follow We are follow energy up. independent for the first time. We don't need all of these countries that we had to fight war over because we needed their energy. We are energy independent. I know more about wind than you do. Oh. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds, it's very intermittent, it's got a lot of problems, and they happen to make the windmills in both Germany and China, and the fumes coming up, if you're a believer in carbon emission, the fumes coming up to make, make these massive windmills is more than anything that we're talking about with natural gas, which is very clean. One other thing. Find me a scientist solar. Say that. I love solar, but solar doesn't quite have it yet. It's not powerful yet to to really run our big, beautiful factories that we need to compete with the world. So False. it's all a pipe dream. But you know what we'll do? We're going to have the greatest economy in the world. But if you want to kill the all economy, right. get rid of your oil industry. You want, and, and what about fracking? All right, now, let me, now let me, have, let me allow fracking. Vice President I Biden to respond. I never said I oppose fracking. You, you said it I, on tape. I did show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is Shows he's flat list. lying. Would you flat. rule out banning fracking? I do rule out banning fracking because the answer we need we need other industries to transition to get to ultimately a complete zero emissions by 2025. What I will do with fracking over time is make sure that we can capture the emissions from the fracking, capture the emissions from gas. We can do that, and we can do that by investing money in doing it, but it's a transition to that. I have one more question excuse in this pot. Excuse and then we, me. We he was against fracking. He said it. I will show that to you tomorrow. I Good. am against fracking. Until he got the nomination, went to Pennsylvania, then he said, but you know what, Pennsylvania? He'll be against it very soon because his party is totally against fracking it. Fracking on federal land, I said. No fracking you and said or fracking oil on federal land. Let me ask this final question in this section, and then I want to move on to our final section. President Trump, people of color are much more likely to live near oil refineries and chemical plants. In Texas, there are families who worry the plants near them are making them sick. Your administration has rolled back regulations on these kinds of facilities. Why should these families give you another four years in office? Uh, the families that we're talking about are employed heavily, and they are making a lot of money, more money than they've ever made. If you look at the kind of numbers that we produce for Hispanic, for Black, for Asian, it's nine times greater the percentage gain than it was under in three years than it was under eight years of the two of them, to put it nicely. Nine times more. Now, somebody lives, I have not heard the numbers or the statistics that you're saying, but they're making a tremendous amount of money economically. We saved it. And I saved it again a number of months ago when oil was crashing because of the pandemic. Okay. We saved it. We got, say what you want about relationship, we got Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Russia to cut back way back. We saved our oil industry, and now it's very vibrant again. Right. And everybody has very inexpensive gasoline. Remember Vice that. President Biden, your response, and then we're going to have a final question for both of you. My response is that those people live on what they call fence lines. He doesn't understand this. They live near chemical plants that, in fact, pollute chemical plants and oil plants and refineries that pollute. I used to live near that when I was growing up in Claymont, Delaware. And all the more oil refineries in Marcus Hook and the Delaware River than there is any place, including in Houston at the time. When my mom get in the car and when, when there were first frost to drive me to school, turn in the windshield, whatever, there'd be oil slick in the window. That's why so many people in my state were dying and getting cancer. The fact is those frontline communities, it doesn't matter what you're paying them. It matters how you keep them safe. What do you do? And you impose restrictions on the pollutions that it, the pollutants coming out of those fence line communities. Okay, I have one final would question. Would you close it down falls, the oil industry? It falls, would you close down the oil industry? By the way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I will that's transition. a big statement. That's it is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because 
the oil industry pollutes significantly. Uh, I see. And here's the deal. But That's you can't a big statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time, over time. And I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies. He won't give federal subsidies to the to the gas. Excuse me, to the to uh, solar and wind. Yeah. Why are we giving it to oil industry? We actually do All give right. it to solar and wind. We and have that's one maybe final the biggest question. statement in terms of business. That's the biggest statement. Okay. Because basically, what he's saying question, is he is Mr. going President. to destroy the oil industry. Okay. Will you remember that Texas? Will you okay. remember that Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President Biden, let me give you ten seconds to respond, Ohio. and then I have to get to the final question. Vice President Biden. He takes everything out of context, but the point is, look, we have to move toward a net zero emissions. The first place to do that by the year 2035 is in energy okay. production, by 2050, totally. All right. One is he final going to get question China to, to do it? No, we're finished with is this. Is he we going to get to China to do it? We have to move on to our final question. No, we have to I'm move going on to rejoin our final Paris question. Accord and make oh. China abide by but, what they agreed to. All right. This is about dollars. leadership, gentlemen. And this first question does go to you, President Trump. Imagine this is your inauguration day. What will you say in your address to, America, to Americans who did not vote for you? You'll each have one minute, starting with you, Mr. We President. have to make a country totally successful, as it was prior to the plague coming in from China. Now we're rebuilding it, and we're doing record numbers, 11.4 million jobs in a short period of time, et cetera. But I will tell you, go back. Before the plague came in, just before, I was getting calls from people that were not normally people that would call me. They wanted to get together. We had the best black unemployment numbers in the history of our country, Hispanic, women, Asian, People with diplomas, with no diplomas, MIT graduates, number one in the class, everybody had the best numbers. And you know what? The other side wanted to get together. They wanted to unify. Success is going to bring us together. We are on the road to success. But I'm cutting taxes, and he wants to raise everybody's taxes, and he wants to put new regulations on everything. He will kill it. If he gets in, you will have a depression, the likes of which you've never seen. Your 401ks will go to hell, and it'll be a very, very sad day for this country. All right. Vice President Biden, same question to you. What will you say during your inaugural address to Americans who did not vote for you? I will say I'm an American president. I represent all of you, whether you voted for me or against me. And I'm going to make sure that you're represented. I'm going to give you hope. We're going to move. We're going to choose science over fiction. We're going to choose hope over fear. We're going to choose to move forward because we have enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities to make things better. We can grow this economy. We can deal with the systemic racism. And at the same time, we can make sure that our economy is being run and moved and motivated by clean energy, creating millions of new jobs. And that's the fact. That's what we're going to do. And and I'm going to say, as I said at the beginning, what is on the ballot here is the character of this country. Decency, honor, respect, treating people with dignity, making sure that everyone has an even chance. And I'm going to make sure you get that. You haven't been getting it the last four years. All right. I want to thank you both for a very robust hour and a half, a fantastic debate. Really appreciate it. President Trump, former Vice President Joe Biden, thank you to Belmont University for hosting us tonight. And most importantly, thank you to those watching tonight. Election Day is November 3rd. Don't forget to vote. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. And uh, an extraordinary final debate between the two candidates, much more substantive and a clash of ideas than we saw in the previous debate between the two candidates. It was as if the muting of the microphones worked, worked. or each of them noticed where their standing was in the polls and knew what they had to do tonight. Gail, you called it. You said that this would be a different President Trump tonight. Because I remember last time, the last 48 hours, we, people were counting. Donald Trump interrupted Joe Biden 73 times. So even his own supporters were saying that was not good. That was not good. And they were embarrassed for him. He came across many thought as obnoxious and a bully. 
And I think, you know, people say Donald Trump doesn't listen to his advisors, but we kept hearing the last 48 hours his advisors saying he's going to tone it down, he knows what he needs to do, and this is probably the last time that he has an opportunity to talk to an audience that is not his base. Mm -hmm. So he knows that people are watching. Joe Biden had to go and do no harm, do no file, don't rock the boat. If I, I think both of them can walk out tonight and say, I did very well. The first question posed to both the candidates is, what would you do in the future yes. to change how the trajectory of the COVID pandemic is going? President Trump did not answer that question. Instead, he said, essentially, it's not his fault and that we're rounding the corner. Yeah, this was an actual debate. I mean, uh, as opposed to some of the other things we've had, there was a real exchange on this question is one of them. President Trump chose to defend his, his record, which is probably wise for him. This is a referendum on the president. It's not about 90 minutes of how he behaved tonight. It's about four years in office. And that's what he's got to defend. But he didn't do on that question or even this last question, which was teed up nicely for the president and for Joe Biden for them to. And the president didn't take advantage of the of those questions. Why is that important? Because the dynamic of the race is the president is behind. And this was the last major opportunity with everybody watching. Uh, and. Uh, he needed more than just adequate. He needed to do something to change the dynamic of the race, and I don't think there was anything in tonight uh, that changed the dynamic of the race, although there were really interesting exchanges, both on COVID, the question of what to do, small business, minimum wage, North Korea, health care, the Obamacare versus the president's yet-to-be-announced long-delayed uh, plan on health care. So there was a lot, of, uh, quite a lot of substance. But, John, do you think either one of them changed the dynamic of the race? If I was, for both Biden supporters and Trump supporters, I would think my candidate did, did very well tonight in terms of addressing. I know there were many times Donald Trump didn't answer the question, right. but I, I think you know, because the last one was so off the rails, the fact that it was civil, I think, was a win. Well, it, it, a win. But what the political scientists will say is unless there's a major, major gaffe, yeah. or, for example, the way the president behaved in the first one, the polls don't change. Mm -hmm. If the polls don't change, Joe Biden is uh, in better shape because mm -hmm. if this race is a referendum on the president's handling of COVID, which a lot of people think it is, the president gets very low marks on that. Mm -hmm. He did nothing tonight no, to, to argue that. about the yeah. future because this future is going well into next year, and it has issues that are health-related, but also the economy doesn't get fixed until COVID gets fixed. Well, he's still saying he did a good job on COVID. And the numbers so. are rising. The rebuttal yes. to anything the president says about COVID comes in the next report on the number of cases in America. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the places that are now struggling are rural areas, which are, have a harder time handling it at the hospitals. We are going to a very tough period. Mm -hmm. The president needed some kind of answer to throw into that future. He was talking about the past. And I think we all know, tracking the president's rhetoric, he had been promising that a vaccine would come before election, election day. Day. The science didn't bear that out, and the company didn't like the political pressure. They wanted to make sure they had all the safety protocols in place. And as we've heard from the head of Pfizer, it won't be till late November, early December, before they submit mm -hmm. approval for a potential mm -hmm. vaccine. And that's why all government officials had said for all of us, the widespread public, to get it, it would be April of mm -hmm. next year at the earliest. I want to bring in CBS's Nicole Killian. She is standing by in the debate hall in Nashville. And Nicole, your impressions of this debate? Well, I can tell you that the Biden campaign is very pleased with the former vice president's performance. They feel that they put the president on the defensive, particularly in the instance uh, where he brought up the president's uh, taxes. One eight telling me that he flipped the script on the president. Uh, the campaign also doesn't feel that the per president's performance tonight changes the trajectory of this race, even if it did take on a softer tone. A few other key takeaways. The vice president, former vice president, clearly trying to make the argument that the president failed the American public on the pandemic. He also didn't take the bait when the president tried to challenge him. And then lastly, making that quintessential art argument at the end that he would be an American president for all, trying to appeal to a broad swath of voters. Nora. Nicole Killian, thank you. CBS's Paula Reed is at the White House. And we saw the president tonight, while he did not interrupt as much as he did in the previous debate, he was on the offense. He was, and we will fact check him later on in this broadcast. And he also made it personal about Biden's family. He did, and that was part of the strategy tonight. I've been texting with some of the president's advisors, and one just texted me back saying, the man stuck to the plan. And part of that plan was not to interrupt, to allow his opponent to speak, potentially make a mistake, 
The other part of the strategy was to bring up Biden's son, Hunter, put those accusations into the mainstream, get them in front of tens of millions of voters. It appears on those two points, he succeeded. Paula Reed, thank you. John, you were going to comment on that? Well, it's a very low bar when you say the goal tonight is not to do the disastrous thing you did last time. That is a bar that you've got to do better than that when the race is not going Yeah, you've got to be on the offense, but without being offensive. But do you think that the voters care about Hunter Biden? No, but, but, but this is Joe not. Biden didn't take the bait on that at all. We have actually Reince Priebus, uh, the former um, head of the Republican National Committee and what Trump's first chief of staff is with us, Valerie Jarrett, former senior advisor to President Barack Obama. I want to get them to weigh in. And Valerie, let me start with you. Uh, we knew that those attacks on Biden's family were coming. You saw Biden respond by saying, I released all 22 years of my tax returns. Where are your tax returns? It's all out there. Well, that's right, Nora. And I think uh, tonight the winners were the American people, particularly the undecided. They had an opportunity to see both men, uh, their competency, their track records, their temperament. And I think that Vice President Biden did a very good job of speaking directly to the American people and framing all of his answers in the context of what it would mean to your life. And I don't think that the American people are interested in his son or or any of those ancillary issues. They're interested in what's happening around their kitchen table. And that's where Joe Biden, I think, is at his strongest, from health care to the COVID-19 to race relations in our country to our stature around the world. Uh, Reince Priebus, uh, you follow the polls, the state of the race so closely. Trump won the senior vote in 2016. He's now trailing Biden, according to The Wall Street Journal, by, with seniors by 27 points. What's happened in the state of this race? Well, I don't know if that's true, Nora. I mean, that's certainly what the poll says, but I don't think that's the case. If that were the case, we'd be losing Florida by double digits right now, and that's just not true. I think President that's Trump probably wins thing. Florida. I think things are a little bit tighter um, in this race than I think some of the people out there are talking about. But look, the president did a few things today, which he was, was in the plan. Number one, uh, I think he was charming tonight. I think it was presidential. I think he obviously let Biden talk, which Dickerson just <laughs> alluded to, but that was important to let Biden talk and give him some rope. Uh, but number three, he pivoted back to Biden a lot. And I think ultimately the biggest score for the president was when he said, all talk, no action. You've been in politics for 47 years. You're vice president for eight years. You didn't do it. And here you are coming here and telling us about all your plans. I mean, there's a lot to talk about tonight. Obviously, we don't have the time to go through it all, but certainly a better debate. I think the president did very well, and I also think the moderator did a much better job. Can we just Reince, touch? Reince, can I ask you a question? Do you think that the president did anything to change the trajectory of this race tonight? Well, you know, the margins, Gail, are so small. I mean, we're talking about 2 to 3 percent of the public out there. Uh, that you can influence in a state like Wisconsin and Michigan. I mean, if you can influence four or 5,000 people in an entire state, it can be the difference between winning and losing. I mean, we're going to go to court potentially over ballot signatures and postage stamps for the next two months, potentially. I hope not, but that could happen. So we're, we're talking about influencing just a speck of people, and that's what it's coming down to. All right. Ryan Priebus and Valerie Jarrett, thank you both. And we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to fact check the candidates when CBS News coverage of the presidential debate continues. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah. The more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh. 
Your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on kdka.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh. Your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on kdka.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Time for the fact check. Let's bring in CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett. Major? We have three for you, Nora. Let's start with the first one. The President Trump said it will go away, referring to coronavirus. We're rounding the corner. It's going away. We rate that as false, and here's why. Coronavirus cases are currently increasing in at least 34 states, hospitalizations rising in 37 states, and here's a key statistic that backs us up on that false assertion. The U.S. is averaging 59,000 new cases per day, according to the New York Times database. That is the most on a daily average since August. The next one, President Trump said they spied on my campaign. The implication being President Obama, Vice President Biden, those in the Obama-Biden White House. Both the Senate Committee on Intelligence and the Department of Justice Inspector General report said that's not true. That's why we rate this as false. There are a lot of chapters and verses to this, and people will say, what about Carter Page? Yes, there was surveillance of Carter Page that has been roundly criticized, even by the inspector general, but he was not a significant player at any time in the Trump campaign. The third one deals with former Vice President Biden's assertion that the Obama-Biden administration did not have a policy of separating families. We rate that as true. They were separated in rare instances to protect children or if those that their parents were identified to be criminals or threats to the children, but it was not a systemic policy as it was with the Trump administration and outgrowth of their zero tolerance policy on the border. Nora, you saw some of those facilities the Trump administration contracted with. That's why we rate the assertion by former Vice President Biden that there was no policy to separate families 
as true. Very helpful. All right. We're going to be back with some final thoughts, including Trump's statement. I'm the least racist person in this room. We'll be right back. So I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news, live. This is CBSN Bay Area, I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area, in your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. The final debate and quite a lot to talk about. That final question, what would you say to the people who didn't vote for you? That's this question, who can be moved? Well, there are small amounts of people that may make a difference in a close contest. And it's a great question because this is what governing is about in an age of high partisanship. When you've got to convince the country to do something on a pandemic, you have to convince the whole country. You can't just talk to your base because the other half of the country is the one staying at home, being afraid and not going out and participating in the economy. You have to have the language to talk to the whole country. It's one of the ways we should test candidates for what the job is like. And the question teed that up and people should go back and look at the answers and see who has the capacity to hear the part of the country that isn't in my base and speak to that part. Donald Trump didn't really answer that question Joe Biden did mm -hmm. how did you see this contest well I was still struck by the, the the question the statement I'm the least racist person in the room well you know first I lost my hearing and then I wondered who else was in the room you know when you're a little kid your mom always tells you actions speak louder than words and when you look at the president's actions you know the last debate he it was a clear dog whistle many people believe to the proud boys to stand back and stand by he keeps saying that I denounce these white supremacist groups. But to denounce them, it says, I do not want your support. But the question by, by Kristen Welker was really about what do you tell a family who's dealing with this? And so it, it evoked an empathetic answer. And instead, it, he said that black lives it. matter. Yes. And then he went about how the chants that were allegedly set at some of the protests. And listen, as someone who has had that conversation, and I, I thought Kristen pointed out really well whether your income level is here or your income level is here because your skin doesn't change when you walk out of the house. Uh, I thought that she really hit that very well, and it would have been a really great opportunity for, for him to address that, and he did not. He spent a lot of time talking about, I've done this for HBCUs. You know, I, he and Tim Scotty always brings up the Opportunity Zones, Empowerment Zones, which is a really good program. But when you don't really figure out a way to unite this community, which is really feeling right now under siege, 
under siege and a lot of pain. He does. He never seems to really address that. And that's where this listening and hearing come in. I think as the nation's top birther for five years, President Trump can't say I'm the. I mean, yeah. he has to jump over that and say something else other than pure assertion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was interesting tonight to hear the president speak as he does in rallies in shorthand. I don't know if anybody knows what an AOC plus three is. Um, Outside and, of Washington, maybe and, not. And even so, so he spoke very much in the staccato pattern of his rallies. Joe Biden was at pains, so much so that the president made fun of him, to talk about the widow or widower who reaches to the empty space in the bed because of COVID, to talk about the oil slick on his wind windshield. Mm -hmm. You can see him narrow casting at those voters in those Midwestern states that he's trying to reach who are uh, with those personal appeals. Joe Biden said tonight the character of the country is on the ballot. He is trying to make this a referendum not only about President Trump's leadership during this pandemic, but also the character of this man and what happens in the next four years. We want to remind everybody, join us on Tuesday, November 3rd, for CBS News live coverage of Election Night. And our coverage of this debate continues now on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. There's going to be more on your local news on this CBS station. I'm Nora O'Donnell. Our thanks to John Dickerson and Gail King. This is CBS News in Washington. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah. The more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage of the second and final 2020 presidential debate. President Trump and Joe Biden shared the stage together for one last time before the November 3rd election. Thursday night's debate featured a number of substantive exchanges on a range of critical issues, including the coronavirus, healthcare, and race in America. Their microphones were muted for certain portions to allow each of them to have two minutes of uninterrupted time to respond to a question. The president's tone was notably different compared to the first debate, which was marked by frequent interruptions and, at times, higher decibel levels. Well, tonight, voters were actually able to hear from the candidates, and the night kicked off with the candidates clashing over the president's handling of the coronavirus, which has killed more than 220,000 people in the United States. Now, both offered sharply different visions of how to handle the pandemic. The president defended his response and promised that a vaccine would be ready in weeks, while the former vice president warned the nation was heading toward a dark winter. The candidates also sparred over election interference and foreign entanglements. President Trump took aim at Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, over his business interests abroad. Both candidates accused each other of corruption. But is this all enough to change the minds of undecided voters in America? Important to note that more than 47 million Americans have already cast their ballots. Here's more of what you may have missed from the debate. It will go away. And as I say, we're rounding the turn. We're rounding the corner. It's going away. 220,000 Americans dead. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control, in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially, anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president. I caught it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Great doctors, great hospitals. We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We have to open our school, and we can't close up our nation, or you're not going to have a nation. He says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it. With regard to Ukraine, we had this whole question about whether or not, because he was on the board, I later learned of a Burisma, a company, that somehow I had done something wrong. Yet every single solitary person, when he was going through his impeachment, testifying under oath who worked for him, said, I did my job impeccably. I carried out U.S. policy. Not one single solitary thing was out of line. His son didn't have a job for a long time, was sadly no longer in the military service. I won't get into that. And he didn't have a job. As soon as he became vice president, Burisma, not the best look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183000 a month. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare. He's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. 10 million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions. And all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. We have done an incredible job environmentally. We have the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the best carbon emission standards that we've seen in many, many years. Climate change and climate warming, the global warming, is an existential threat to humanity. We have a moral obligation to deal with it. If he gets in, you will have a depression the likes of which you've never seen. It'll be a very, very sad day for this country. I'm going to make sure that you're represented I'm going to give you hope. We're going to move. We're going to choose science over fiction. We're going to choose hope over fear. We're going to choose to move forward because we have enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities to make things better. We can 
Joining me now to break down the debate is Caitlin Huey Burns, Nicole Killian, and Major Garrett. Caitlin is CBSN's political reporter. Nicole is a CBS News correspondent. They both join us from Nashville. And Major is our CBS News chief Washington correspondent joining us from Washington. Welcome. It's great to have you all. Nicole, you are there in the debate hall. Um, I want to get your take on the president's strategy for this particular debate. It seemed to be noticeably different than the approach he took uh, at the first debate. Well, it was different, but in some ways it was the same. And look ahead of the debate, a uh, Trump campaign official told me that uh, certainly while the president was going to try to abide by the rules of this debate, if he felt the need to interject, he would. So I think you saw that tonight. He did show more restraint, but he also jumped in where he felt he wanted to challenge the former vice president. And so, uh, you know, certainly while we saw a, a softer tone from, from both of the candidates, you know, it did end up being more more substantive uh, for the viewers. Certainly, uh, the Trump campaign is feeling pretty good about uh, their candidate's performance, as is uh, the Biden campaign, uh, which tells me they feel that they put the president on the defensive tonight, uh, that they feel that even though there was this softer tone, it may not have necessarily changed the trajectory of the race as far as the president's concerned. Yeah, um, Caitlin, let me ask you, going into the night, what were officials at the Biden campaign saying about the mission for the former vice president tonight? Well, the mission for Biden was the opposite of President Trump, which was to keep this race the way it is, keep it at status quo, not to do anything to disrupt the state of this race right now. And that's because Biden is leading in key battleground states, and he's leading on the issue of handling coronavirus. We've seen that in our polling in key states, that voters are disapproving of the president's handling of the pandemic, and that is contributing to Biden's lead in a few key states. So that's why you saw the Biden campaign try to not rock the boat and try to keep the pandemic front and center. This comes, of course, as the president seems to have been listening to advisors who, after the last debate, said that they wanted to, well, they wanted him to interrupt less and allow Biden more time to stumble. We didn't see huge stumbles from Biden tonight. The question, of course, is with 12 days left and 47 million people having already cast their ballots, does this do much to change the trajectory of the race? Republicans might look at tonight and think, Maybe it helped, and maybe it helped some down-ballot Republicans in key Senate races uh, that are going to be really big contests. The Biden team, however, believes that even if the president displayed a different kind of behavior than he did at the first debate, that the president is still who he is. And you heard that from Biden tonight, saying, you know who I am, you know who he is, the character is on the ballot. Well, the debate started with President Trump being asked about a surging number of coronavirus cases. He talked about his own illness and had this to say about a potential vaccine. Let's listen. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks. President Trump, I'd like to follow up with you and your comments. You talked about taking a therapeutic. I assume you're referencing Regeneron. You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is, not a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks, and it will be distributed very quickly. So, Major, what is the reality when it comes to a vaccine? that it's in development, that the administration has poured billions of dollars into it, and with its Operation Warp Speed has prioritized this above any other COVID-19 response. And there are plenty of people in the academic and research world who say all the steps, that, or many of the steps the administration has taken have moved this at an incredibly rapid pace. And if a vaccine that is accepted and responsive, meaning effective, can be developed by the end of this calendar year, that would be approximately warp speed. That's not before the election. That was a persistent promise of this president. It's not going to happen. And the very rhetoric that he used, almost trying to guarantee that, politicized the vaccine itself, dampening public willingness to accept a Trump-manufactured, if you will, in a political context, vaccine. 
and the president had to back off all of that. But that doesn't mean that if a vaccine is available and in tens of millions of doses by the end of this year and given to the most vulnerable populations and frontline workers, that that's not a net positive for this country. It most certainly will be. And the administration can at least point to some element of credit for that. The other problem, though, is cases keep increasing, hospitalizations keep increasing, and the president just seems stubbornly indifferent to that set of data. And that indifference wraps him ever tightly around his overall response and overall approach to this underlying pandemic, which is to say it's always going to be better, even when the data don't back that up. Um, and Nicole, I want to turn to you next. I know you have to get going in a few minutes, but there was a, a moment, and I'm going to call for this SOT number 10 control room coming up here, uh, just so uh, our viewers can understand the context of this response. The moderator, Kristen Welker, asked the candidates at one point about the issue of black and brown Americans. She said, I want to talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. She mentioned part of the experience being something called the talk, where you have have people, regardless of class and income, people of color who are parents feeling as though they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that perhaps they could be targeted, including by the police, she said, for no reason other than the color of their skin. She very directly said, Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Now let's go ahead and listen to the answers. I do. You know, my daughter is a social worker. I never had to tell my daughter, if she's pulled over, make sure she puts for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child when you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street. President Trump, same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, he's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. And he said that, he said it, super predators. And they have never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Nicole, how did that answer, in particular from President Trump, comport with what we've heard from the president on this issue of race in America uh, in earlier kind of commentary and other scenarios where he's been asked about this? Uh, well, look, I mean, I think this is an argument that you've heard the president make many times before when the issue of race comes up, specifically as it relates to African Americans. He tries to make the case that he has done a lot for African Americans, but certainly many would challenge that based on some of his rhetoric. You also heard uh, Christian Welker ask him uh, about that, uh, you know, even with the first debate uh, where he, you know, made that reference to the Proud Boys of, you know, stand back, stand down. So from that standpoint, you know, sometimes I think it's hard for some in the African-American community to know really where this president comes down uh, when you want to say you're doing a lot for them, but then you're also kind of making uh, comments to the contrary. Uh, but look, you know, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden had some explaining to do, too. He has taken a lot of flack, uh, particularly among uh, African-American uh, African American males for that 1994 crime bill. Uh, you know, you heard him uh, talk about, uh, you know, it being a mistake as far as some of these harsher uh, rules that have been on the books that led to the mass incarceration of African-American men, you know, and we even talked to some uh, black male voters uh, here in Nashville before the debate and, you know, one of them telling me they didn't feel that either candidate has really done enough um, and really have plans that fully address, uh, you know, the African-American community, not knowing that it's not a monolith, but uh, certainly they felt that both campaigns kind of had a little bit more 
uh, that they needed to do uh, on this issue. So I think you heard of both of the candidates try to make that appeal as best they can, even though they uh, can't necessarily be in the shoes of a black or brown person. You know, this did give them the opportunity to uh, at least try to show that they understand uh, some of the systemic racism uh, that we have seen in this country, you know, for hundreds of years. All right, Nicole Killian for us. Nicole, I know you have to get going. Thank you so much for staying up late with us. We really appreciate it. Let's continue our conversation. And Caitlin, I want to turn back to the issue of the coronavirus because, not surprisingly, Joe Biden did go after President Trump very forcefully on his response to the coronavirus. Let's go ahead and listen to some of that. He says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it. So we heard Joe Biden, Caitlin, attacking the president's response. Did the former vice president give Americans a sense of what his own response to the pandemic would be if elected? I think that line, learning to live with it versus learning to die with it, is something that you're going to hear the Biden campaign repeat over and over in the coming days, wanting to put a referendum on the president's handling of the pandemic. There have been questions about what would have been different under a Biden administration. He tried to make the argument that containing the virus would be also a way to contain the residual effects of it. That was also a line of questioning tonight. Is the, uh, is the response and the residual effects worse than uh, the pandemic itself? The president on the debate stage and throughout this campaign has argued for opening things back up again, trying to put the virus behind him, even though cases are spiking, uh, particularly in the Midwest. The Biden team has tried to say that in order to uh, prevent some of these big effects, especially on the economy, containing the virus earlier on and acknowledging it uh, would have been the way to go. That's a question that uh, voters are going to have to answer when they uh, ultimately cast their ballots or something that would be on the minds as they cast their ballots. What's really interesting to me, having been on the ground in several key battleground states over the past couple of weeks, is that the virus, the, the, the pandemic is either everything or it's not. For Biden supporters, they often tell us that the pandemic is front and center. It's something that has altered the course of their lives. They've either known people that have died or suffered from the virus, or it's just uprooted their daily lives, not being able to send their kids to school or see their parents. For Trump supporters, when we ask them about the pandemic, it's not top of mind. Instead, the economy is. And they continue to say that they want the economy to get back to where it was before the pandemic. So it's really interesting to see kind of how this message is distilled depending on who you're supporting. Or maybe that's how it's shaping who you're supporting. Uh, let's turn to the issue of health care. It's, of course, a crucial issue in this election. Both President Trump and Joe Biden were asked about their respective plans tonight in control room. I'm going to call for SOT number six here next. But let's go ahead and play some of what the president said uh, about his health care plan. Let's take a listen. And here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare because without the individual mandate, it's much different. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new beautiful health care. All right. So, Major, evaluate that statement for us, knowing what we know about the Trump administration and its current posture towards Obamacare. I'm sure it's true the president would like to come up with a beautiful health care plan. I'm sure that's true. He would like to. He never has. That's just a fact. He tried to argue that with Leslie Stahl in the 60 Minutes interview. A lot of us will see on Sunday. But there is no plan. There was an effort to create a plan back in the early stages of the, of, the, of the Trump administration when Republicans controlled the House and the Senate. The House passed a bill that the Senate Republicans 
couldn't abide. And the Senate Republicans couldn't pass a bill and go to conference over it. And the White House was left with nothing. And left with nothing has been the posture of the Trump White House ever since. Nothing, no plan. And the president can say he wants to protect pre-existing conditions and other component parts of the Affordable Care Act that are very, very popular. But to do that, you have to have some means of creating exchanges in the health insurance market and maintaining private insurance, what the president says he wants to do, and a means by which to accomplish that that is different than the Affordable Care Act. And Republicans, not legislatively, not rhetorically, not even on the back of an envelope, have come up with something that does that. And until they do, it's all just rhetoric. And the voters have figured this out. It was a big issue in 2018 when Democrats regained control of the House. It is a big issue now. And when the president talks to former Vice President Biden and says, all you do is promise you never get anything done, on this issue of health care, he is just as vulnerable to that allegation. Because he's been the president, he had a Republican House and Republican Senate, didn't do it, and has done nothing with the Democratic House majority since. And this idea of him liking to have a plan, sure, I'd like to have a lot of things. But when you're president, you have to put pen to paper, write something down, and find a legislative compromise. No progress there. Let's turn to the issue of immigration. And I specifically want to turn to an exchange between the candidates relating to the separation of families at the U.S.-Mexico border under the Trump administration. Let's go ahead and listen to that. These 500-plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. Bay, real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot, it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Kristen, they did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not. They separate built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, about. Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. It's criminal. Right. So for people, Major, who aren't familiar, um, the the question there was really referencing this report where uh, you have some 545 children right. whose parents um, were separated from them yep. who cannot now be found. Right. Um, Major, what did you hear in those answers? Uh, you know, uh, that exchange was quite lengthy. That was just part of it. But uh, that was one of those moments where there was clearly a sharp distinction to be drawn between these two candidates. A sharp distinction, but it was a classic effort by the president to take one slender fact and extrapolate it into an entire argument. The slender fact is there were some families under the Obama-Biden administration who, upon crossing the border, parents were separated from children. There were two distinct reasons for that. The children were deemed to be in jeopardy because the parents were untrustworthy, or one of the two parents, or in some cases just one, had a known criminal record. And that was something that they were not going to let the children stay with, and they were going to house that person attempting to cross the border with, without proper documentation in a criminal system because they were a known threat. And were there facilities with fencing involved? Yes. That's the slender fact. What he extrapolated in is the exact same thing that the Trump administration did, which is a complete falsehood. The Trump administration created a policy called zero tolerance, which meant anyone who attempted to cross the border without documentation was going to be held in custody. And when you were held in custody, parents were separated from children, everyone. And there were large facilities, and the federal government contracted with lots of different corporations to build them in Florida and in Texas. This became a large example and a visible one of this administration, the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy for attempting to cross the border without proper documentation. And the separation of the children was a necessary outgrowth of that policy decision. That policy did not exist during the Obama-Biden administration. So when former Vice President Biden said, we didn't do that as a matter of policy, he's correct. But then President Trump says, oh no, what about the cages? Who built the cages? Because there are pictures and there are some very slender examples of that. 
But that doesn't mean it was a policy, and it doesn't mean it was anywhere near as widespread as under the Trump administration. Uh, Caitlin, on the issue of climate change, so President Trump has said that Joe Biden's climate plan is the Green New Deal, which Joe Biden has denied. He has said numerous times now that he would not ban fracking, but would invest more in renewable energy. Is he trying to appeal to people on both sides of the aisle with this climate plan? This is really a battle for voters in that key state of Pennsylvania, which was determined by about 44,000 votes in 2016. That's why you hear the president continuing to press the former vice president on his position. Biden has said that he would oppose new fracking on federal lands. And we've seen Biden also try to not only engage suburban voters around Philadelphia, but also speak to voters who turned out for Trump in 2016, trying to kind of build this broader coalition of revving up the Democratic Party base and new additions to it that we saw in 2018, while also trying to reach out to voters who may be inclined to support the president or had supported him before. So that's what this issue is really about. We see climate change as a key animating issue for Democratic voters. This was an issue that all the time on the campaign trail covering the Democratic primary, voters would bring up unprompted, particularly younger voters, because this is an issue, climate change, is an issue that they have to deal with in their lifetimes. And so that's kind of where Biden is trying to go with this. And that's why the president, you heard him say, listen in Pennsylvania, listen in some of these other states to how the former vice president responded to that. Uh, finally, Major, uh, I know a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was, on the takeout you had as your guests, Corey Lewandowski mm -hmm. and Dave Bossie, yep. uh, people whose names may not be familiar to folks outside of Washington, but um, who clearly have the ear of the president. And I wonder um, what your thoughts are on the president that we saw tonight and his approach, the strategy that he took, um, whether you think there's a connection there between the influence of those two who, as I, I think you've said on other shows, are now coming back into the fold yes. uh, very within much back sort of in the, the president's, very much back in the fold. Is that an influence that you saw tonight with respect to the president's performance? Absolutely. And just to remind people, Corey Lewandowski was President Donald Trump's first campaign manager up until about the summer, mid-summer of 2016. And Dave Bossie became the deputy campaign manager late summer all the way through crossing the finish line into the election victory in November. So they are significant players. They've never come into the Trump administration in any capacity, been invited to, or maybe some people have wanted to keep them out because they knew of their influence with President Trump. Either way, they've been on the outside, but now they're back in, not in a formal way. They're not getting paid, so far as I understand, but their advice is being sought on a regular basis. And what I saw tonight in the debate was two things. One, the debate commission did President Trump two enormous favors. One, it changed the rules, giving him something to bark about and complain about, and another part of the media or the Washington system that's against him. So it's a whipping boy for his supporters to get angry about. That's one thing. The other thing it did for him is it changed the rules in a way that allowed the debate prep team, which includes Corey Lewandowski and Dave Bossy, to say to the president, keep your mouth shut. Let Biden talk. Parry when you have your points and use this to your advantage, which the president did. The rules forced this upon him, but it also allowed him to take the advice from his debate prep team more seriously to heart. And much of his debate performance reflected that. One other thing that also looks very much to me Lewandowski and Bossy influenced. If you were to sort of take the main driving points of President Trump tonight, they were as follows. Economy, not a career politician, corruption and China. All four were part of the 2016 message against Hillary Clinton. All four. And many of those four did not show up in that first debate at all in any way, shape or form. And the president tried to get back to those four. The biggest problem for the president on the corruption angle is people simply do not view former Vice President Biden in the way they did Hillary Clinton. Even 
some nominal and loosely attached Democrats thought there was something maybe shaky about the overall ethics of the Clinton family or Hillary Clinton. And most Republicans had already made up their mind about that, didn't need any persuasion, no convincing at all because of a 20-year systematic effort by Republicans to so define Hillary Clinton. Former Vice President Biden does not exist in that world. So it's a much harder, much more aggressive campaign you have to wage. And in this light stage of the campaign, there's really no sense within the Trump campaign that it's going to stick and stick hard. But it was there, those four pillars, China, corruption, not a career politician, and the economy. All of that reflects the kind of counsel that I know Dave Bossy and Corey Lewandowski brought to the debate prep process. All right. Well, Caitlin Huey Burns and Major Garrett, we are now that much closer to November 3rd. I want to thank you both very much. Really appreciate it. Sure. And a reminder, our debate coverage will continue Friday starting at 9 a.m. Eastern right here on CBSN. And if you missed any of the past debates or an episode of Red and Blue, you can catch up right now on the CBS News website. Just head to cbsnews.com slash red and blue. We are going to take a quick break, but we've got the rest of your day's news ahead. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 